A Passage to India, written in 1924, is a novel by English author, E. M. Forster, set against the backdrop of the British rule, and the Indian independence movement in the 1920s. It was selected as one of the hundred great works, of 20th century English literature, by the Modern Library and won the 1924 James Tate Black Memorial Prize, for fiction. Time magazine included the novel in its all-time 100 novels list. The story revolves around four characters, Dr. Aziz, his British friend Mr. Cyril Fielding, Mrs. Moore, and Miss Adela Quested. During a trip to the fictitious Marabar Caves, Adela thinks she finds herself alone with Dr. Aziz in one of the caves, when in fact he is in an entirely different cave, and subsequently panics and flees. It is assumed that Dr. Aziz has attempted to assault her. Aziz's trial, and its run-up and aftermath, bring to a boil the common racial tensions and prejudices between Indians and the British, who ruled India. A Passage to India, by E. M. Forster, Part 1, Mosque, Chapter 1. Except for the Marabar Caves and they are twenty miles off, the city of Chandrapur presents nothing extraordinary. Edged rather than washed by the river Ganges, it trails for a couple of miles along the bank, scarcely distinguishable from the rubbish it deposits so freely. There are no bathing steps on the river front as the Ganges happens not to be holy here, indeed there is no river front, and bazaars shut out the wide and shifting panorama of the stream. The streets are mean, the temples ineffective, and though a few fine houses exist they are hidden away in gardens or down alleys whose filth deters all but the invited guest. Chandrapur was never large or beautiful, but two hundred years ago it lay on the road between Upper India, then Imperial, and the sea, and the fine houses date from that period. The zest for decoration stopped in the 18th century, nor was it ever democratic. There is no painting and scarcely any carving in the bazaars. The very wood seems made of mud, the inhabitants of mud moving so abased, so monotonous is everything that meets the eye, that when the Ganges comes down it might be expected to wash the excrescence back into the soil. Houses do fall, people are drowned and left rotting, but the general outline of the town persists, swelling here, shrinking there, like some low but indestructible form of life. Inland, the prospect alters. There is an oval maiden, and a long sallow hospital. Houses belonging to Eurasians stand on the high ground by the railway station. Beyond the railway, which runs parallel to the river, the land sinks, then rises again rather steeply. On the second rise is laid out the little civil station, and viewed hence Chandrapur appears to be a totally different place. It is a city of gardens. It is no city, but a forest sparsely scattered with huts. It is a tropical plesson swashed by a noble river, the toddy palms and neem trees and mangoes and sacred fig that were hidden behind the bazaars now become visible and in their turn hide the bazaars. They rise from the gardens where ancient tanks nourish them, they burst out of stifling perlius and unconsidered temples, seeking, light and dare, and endowed with more strength than man or his works, they soar above the lower deposit to greet one another with branches and beckoning leaves, and to build a city for the birds, especially after the rains do they screen what passes below, but at all times, even when scorched or leafless, they glorify the city to the English people who inhabit the rise so that newcomers cannot believe it to be as meagre as it is described, and have to be driven down to acquire disillusionment. As for the civil station itself, 
it provokes no emotion, it charms not, neither does it repel, it is sensibly planned, with a red brick club on its brow, and farther back a grocer's and a cemetery, and the bungalows are disposed along roads that intersect at right angles, it has nothing hideous in it, and only the view is beautiful, it shares nothing with the city except the overarching sky. The sky too has its changes, but they are less marked than those of the vegetation and the river. Clouds map it up at times, but it is normally a dome of blending tints, and the main tint blue. By day the blue will pale down into white where it touches the white of the land. After sunset it has a new circumference, orange melting upwards into tenderest purple, but the core of blue persists, and so it is by night, then the stars hang like lamps from the immense vault, the distance between the vault and them is as nothing to the distance behind them, and that farther distance, though beyond color, last freed itself from blue, the sky settles everything, not only climates and seasons but when the earth shall be beautiful, by herself she can do little, only feeble outbursts of flowers, but when the sky chooses, glory can rain into the Chandra Purbazas or a benediction pass from horizon to horizon, the sky can do this because it is so strong and so enormous, strength comes from the sun, infused in it daily, sighs from the prostrate earth, no mountains infringe on the curve, league after league the earth lies flat, heaves a little, is flat again, only in the south, where a group of fists and fingers are thrust up through the soil, is the endless expanse interrupted, these fists and fingers are the Marabah hills, containing the extraordinary caves. Chapter 2 Abandoning his bicycle, which fell before a servant could catch it, the young man sprang up onto the balcony, he was all animation. Hamidullah? Am I late? He cried. Do not apologize, said his host. You are always late. Kindly answer my question. Am I late? Has Muhammad Ali eaten all the food? If so I go elsewhere. Mr. Muhammad Ali, how are you? Thank you. Dr. Aziz, I am dying. Dying before your dinner? Oh, poor Muhammad Ali. Hamidullah here is actually dead. He passed away just as you rode up on your bike. Yes, that is so said the other, imagine us both as addressing you from another and a happier world. Does there happen to be such a thing as a hookah in that happier world of yours? Aziz, don't chatter, we are having a very sad talk. The hookah had been packed too tight, as was usual in his friend's house, and bubbled sulkily. He coaxed it, yielding at last, the tobacco jetted up into his lungs and nostrils driving out the smoke of burning cow dung that had filled them as he rode through the bazaar. It was delicious. He lay in a trance, sensuous but healthy, through which the talk of the two others did not seem particularly sad. They were discussing as to whether or no it is possible to be friends with an Englishman. Muhammad Ali argued that it was not, Hamidullah disagreed, but with so many reservations that there was no friction between them. Delicious indeed to lie on the broad balcony with the moon rising in front and the servants preparing dinner behind, and no trouble happening. Well, look at my own experience this morning. I only contend that it is possible in England, replied Hamidullah, who had been to that country long ago, before the big rush and had received a cordial welcome at Cambridge. It is impossible here, Aziz. The red-nosed boy has again insulted me in court. I do not blame him. He was told that he ought to insult me. Until lately he was quite a nice boy, but the others have got hold of him. Yes, they have no chance here, that is my point. They come out intending to be gentlemen, 
and are told it will not do, look at Leslie, look at Blackiston, now it is your red-nosed boy, and Fielding will go next. Why, I remember when Turton came out first. It was in another part of the province. You fellows will not believe me, but I have driven with Turton in his carriage. Turton? Oh yes, we were once quite intimate. He has shown me his stamp collection. He would expect you to steal it now. Turton? But red-nosed boy will be far worse than Turton. I do not think so. They all become exactly the same, not worse, not better. I give any Englishman two years, be he Turton or Burton. It is only the difference of a letter, and I give any English woman six months. All are exactly alike. Do you not agree with me? I do not, replied Muhammad Ali, entering into the bit of fun and feeling both pain and amusement at each word that was uttered. For my own part one finds such profound differences among our rulers. Red nose mumbles, Turton talks distinctly, Mrs. Turton takes bribes, Mrs. Red nose does not and cannot, because so far there is no Mrs. Red nose. Bribes? Did you not know that when they were lent to Central India over a canal scheme, some Raja or other gave her a sewing machine in solid gold so that the water should run through his state? And does it? No, that is where Mrs. Turton is so skillful. When we poor blacks take bribes, we perform what we are bribed to perform, and the law discovers us in consequence. The English take and do nothing. I admire them. We all admire them. Aziz, please pass me the hooker. Oh, not yet. Hooker is so jolly now. You are a very selfish boy. He raised his voice suddenly, and shouted for dinner. Servants shouted back that it was ready. They meant that they wished it was ready, and were so understood for nobody moved. Then Hamidullah continued, but with changed manner and evident emotion. But take my case, the case of young Hugh Bannister. Here is the son of my dear, my dead friends, the Reverend and Mrs. Bannister, whose goodness to me in England I shall never forget or describe. They were father and mother to me, I talked to them as I do now. In the vacations their rectory became my home. They entrusted all their children to me. I often carried little Hugh about. I took him up to the funeral of Queen Victoria, and held him in my arms above the crowd. Queen Victoria was different, murmured Muhammad Ali. I learn now that this boy is in business as a leather merchant at Cornpool. Imagine how I long to see him and to pay his fare that this house may be his home, but it is useless. The other Anglo-Indians will have got hold of him long ago. He will probably think that I want something, and I cannot face that from the son of my old friends. Oh, what in this country has gone wrong with everything, Vakil Saib? I ask you. Aziz joined in. Why talk about the English? Why be either friends with the fellows or not friends? Let us shut them out and be jolly. Queen Victoria and Mrs. Bannister were the only exceptions, and they're dead. No, no, I do not admit that. I have met others. So have I, said Muhammad Ali, unexpectedly veering. All ladies are far from alike. Their mood was changed and they recalled little kindnesses and courtesies. She said thank you so much in the most natural way. She offered me a lozenge when the dust irritated my throat. Hamidullah could remember more important examples of angelic ministration, but the other, who only knew Anglo-India, had to ransack his memory for scraps and it was not surprising that he should return to but of course all this is exceptional, the exception does not prove the rule. The average woman is like Mrs. Turton, and, Aziz, you know what she is. Aziz did not know, but said he did. He too generalized from his disappointments, 
It is difficult for members of a subject race to do otherwise. Granted the exceptions, he agreed that all English women are haughty and venal. The gleam passed from the conversation, whose wintry surface unrolled and expanded interminably. A servant announced dinner. They ignored him. The elder men had reached their eternal politics, as ease drifted into the garden. The trees smelt sweet green blossom champak, and scraps of Persian poetry came into his head. Dinner, dinner, dinner but when he returned to the house for it, Muhammad Ali had drifted away in his turn, to speak to his say. Come and see my wife a little then, said Hamidullah, and they spent twenty minutes behind the veiled. Hamidullah Begum was a distant aunt of Aziz, and the only female relative he had in Chandrapur, and she had much to say to him on this occasion about a family circumcision that had been celebrated with imperfect pomp. It was difficult to get away, because until they had had their dinner she would not begin hers, and consequently prolonged her remarks in case they should suppose she was impatient. Having censured the circumcision, she bethought her of kindred caps, and asked Aziz when he was going to be married. Respectful but irritated, he answered, once is enough. Yes, he has done his duty, said Hamidullah. Do not tease him so. He carries on his family, two boys and their sister. Aunt, they live most comfortably with my wife's mother where she was living when she died. I can see them whenever I like. They are such very, very small children. And he sends them the whole of his salary and lives like a low-grade clerk, and tells no one the reason. What more do you require him to do? But this was not Hamidullah Begum's point, and having courteously changed the conversation for a few moments she returned and made it. She said, what is to become of all our daughters if men refuse to marry? They will marry beneath them, or... And she began the oft-told tale of a lady of imperial descent who could find no husband in the narrow circle where her pride permitted her to mate, and had lived on unwed, her age now thirty, and would die unwed, for no one would have her now. While the tale was in progress, it convinced the two men, the tragedy seemed a slur on the whole community, better polygamy almost, than that a woman should die without the joys God has intended her to receive. Wedlock, motherhood, power in the house, for what else is she born, and how can the man who has denied them to her stand up to face her creator and his own at the last day? Aziz took his leave saying perhaps but later his invariable reply to such an appeal. You mustn't put off what you think right, said Hamidullah. That is why India is in such a plight, because we put off things. But seeing that his young relative looked worried, he added a few soothing words, and thus wiped out any impression that his wife might have made. During their absence, Muhammad Ali had gone off in his carriage leaving a message that he should be back in five minutes, but they were on no account to wait. They sat down to meet with a distant cousin of the house, Muhammad Latif, who lived on Hamidullah's bounty and who occupied the position neither of a servant nor of an equal. He did not speak unless spoken to and since no one spoke kept unoffended silence. Now and then he belched, in compliment to the richness of the food. A gentle, happy and dishonest old man, all his life he had never done a stroke of work. So long as someone of his relatives had a house he was sure of a home, and it was unlikely that so large a family would all go bankrupt. His wife led a similar existence some hundreds of miles away. He did not visit her, owing to the expense of the railway ticket. Presently Aziz chaffed him, also the servants, and then began quoting poetry, Persian, Urdu, a little Arabic. His memory was good, and for so young a man he had read largely, 
The themes he preferred were the decay of Islam and the brevity of love. They listened delighted, for they took the public view of poetry, not the private which obtains in England. It never bored them to hear words, words, they breathed them with the cool night air, never stopping to analyze, the name of the poet, Hafiz, Harley, Iqbal, was sufficient guarantee. India, a hundred Indias, whispered outside beneath the indifferent moon, but for the time India seemed one and their own, and they regained their departed greatness by hearing its departure lamented, they felt young again because reminded that youth must fly. A servant in scarlet interrupted him, he was the servant of the civil surgeon, and he handed Aziz a note. Old Calendar wants to see me at his bungalow, he said, not rising. He might have the politeness to say why. Some case, I dare say. I dare say not, I dare say nothing. He has found out our dinner hour, that's all, and chooses to interrupt us every time, in order to show his power. On the one hand he always does this, on the other it may be a serious case, and you cannot know, said Hamidullah, considerately paving the way towards obedience. Had you not better clean your teeth after pan? If my teeth are to be cleaned, I don't go at all. I am an Indian, it is an Indian habit to take pan. The civil surgeon must put up with it. Muhammad Latif my bike, please. The poor relation got up, slightly immersed in the realms of matter, he laid his hand on the bicycle's saddle, while a servant did the actual wheeling, between them they took it over at intact. Aziz held his hands under the ewer, dried them, fitted on his green felt hat, and then with unexpected energy whizzed out of Hamidullah's compound. Aziz, imprudent boy, but he was far down the bazaar, riding furiously. He had neither light nor bell nor had he a break, but what use are such adjuncts in a land where the cyclist's only hope is to coast from face to face, and just before he collides with each it vanishes, and the city was fairly empty at this hour. When his tire went flat, he leapt off and shouted for a horse cart. He did not at first find one and he had also to dispose of his bicycle at a friend's house. He dallied furthermore to clean his teeth, but at last he was rattling towards the civil lines, with a vivid sense of speed. As he entered their arid tidiness, depression suddenly seized him. The roads, named after victorious generals and intersecting at right angles, were symbolic of the net Great Britain had thrown over India. He felt caught in their meshes. When he turned into Major Corlander's compound he could with difficulty restrain himself from getting down from the horse cart and approaching the bungalow on foot, and this not because his soul was servile but because his feelings, the sensitive edges of him, feared a gross snub. There had been a case last year, an Indian gentleman had driven up to an official's house and been turned back by the servants and been told to approach more suitably, only one case among thousands of visits to hundreds of officials, but its fame spread wide. The young man shrank from a repetition of it, he compromised, and stopped the driver just outside the flood of light that fell across the balcony. The civil surgeon was out. But the sahib has left me some message. The servant returned an indifferent no. Aziz was in despair. It was a servant whom he had forgotten to tip, and he could do nothing now because there were people in the hall. He was convinced that there was a message and that the man was withholding it out of revenge. While they argued, the people came out. Both were ladies. Aziz lifted his hat. The first, who was in evening dress, glanced at the Indian and turned instinctively away. Mrs. Leslie, it is a horse cart, she cried. Ours? inquired the second, also seeing Aziz, 
and doing likewise. Take the gifts the gods provide, anyhow, she screeched, and both jumped in. Oh horse cartwalla, club, why doesn't the fool go? Go, I will pay you tomorrow, said Aziz to the driver, and as they went off he called courteously, you are most welcome, ladies. They did not reply, being full of their own affairs. So it had come, the usual thing, just as Muhammad Ali said. The inevitable snub, his bow ignored, his carriage taken. It might have been worse, for it comforted him somehow that may damn Callender and Leslie should both be fat and weigh the horse cart down behind. Beautiful women would have pained him. He turned to the servant gave him a couple of rupees, and asked again whether there was a message. The man, now very civil, returned the same answer. Major Callender had driven away half an hour before, saying nothing. He had as a matter of fact said, damn as these words that the servant understood, but was too polite to repeat. One can tip too much as well as too little, Indeed the coin that buys the exact truth has not yet been minted. Then I will write him a letter. He was offered the use of the house, but was too dignified to enter it. Paper and ink were brought onto the balcony, he began, Dear Sir, comma, at your express command I have hastened as a subordinate should, and then stopped. Tell him I have called. That is sufficient, he said, tearing the protest up. Here is my card. Call me a horse cart. Master, all are at the club. Then telephone for one down to the railway station. And since the man hastened to do this he said, enough, enough, I prefer to walk. He commandeered a match and lit a cigarette. These attentions, though purchased, soothed him. They would last as long as he had rupees, which is something but to shake the dust of Anglo-India off his feet to escape from the net and be back among manners and gestures that he knew. He began a walk, an unwanted exercise. He was an athletic little man, daintily put together, but really very strong. Nevertheless walking fatigued him, as it fatigues everyone in India except the newcomer. There is something hostile in that soil. It either yields, and the foot sinks into a depression, or else it is unexpectedly rigid and sharp, pressing stones or crystals against the dread. A series of these little surprises exhausts, and he was wearing pumps a poor preparation for any country. At the edge of the civil station he turned into a mosque to rest. He had always liked this mosque. It was gracious, and the arrangement pleased him. The courtyard, entered through a ruined gate, contained an ablution tank of fresh clear water, which was always in motion, being indeed part of the conduit that supplied the city. The courtyard was paved with broken slabs. The covered part of the mosque was deeper than is usual, its effect was that of an English parish church whose site has been taken out. Where he sat, he looked into three arcades whose darkness was illuminated by a small hanging lamp and by the moon. The front, in full moonlight, had the appearance of marble and the ninety-nine names of God on the frieze stood out black, as the frieze stood out white against the sky. The contest between this dualism and the contention of shadows within pleased Aziz, and he tried to symbolize the whole into some truth of religion or love. A mosque by winning his approval let loose his imagination. The temple of another creed, Hindu, Christian, or Greek would have bored him and failed to awaken his sense of beauty. Here was Islam, his own country, more than a faith, more than a battle cry, more, much more. Islam, an attitude towards life both exquisite and durable, where his body and his thoughts found their home. His seat was the low wall that bounded the courtyard on the left. The ground fell away beneath him towards the city visible as a blur of trees, 
and in the stillness he heard many small sounds. On the right, over in the club, the English community contributed an amateur orchestra. Elsewhere some Hindus were drumming, he knew they were Hindus, because the rhythm was uncongenial to him, comma, and others were bewailing a corpse, he knew whose, having certified it in the afternoon. There were owls, the Punjab mail and flowers smelt deliciously in the station master's garden. But the mosque, that alone signified, and he returned to it from the complex appeal of the night, and decked it with meanings the builder had never intended. Some day he too would build a mosque, smaller than this but in perfect taste, so that all who passed by should experience the happiness he felt now. And near it, under a low dome, should be his tomb, with a Persian inscription, alas, Without me for thousands of years the rose will blossom and the spring will bloom, but those who have secretly understood my heart, they will approach and visit the grave where I lie. He had seen the quatrain on the tomb of Arikan king, and regarded it as profound philosophy. He always held pathos to be profound. The secret understanding of the heart. He repeated the phrase with tears in his eyes and as he did so one of the pillars of the mosque seemed to quiver. It swayed in the gloom and detached itself. Belief in ghosts ran in his blood, but he sat firm. Another pillar moved, a third, and then an English woman stepped out into the moonlight. Suddenly he was furiously angry and shouted, Madam! Oh! The woman gasped, Madam, this is a mosque! you have no right here at all, you should have taken off your shoes, this is a holy place for Muslims. I have taken them off. You have? I left them at the entrance. Then I ask your pardon. Still startled, the woman moved out, keeping the ablution tank between them. He called after her, I am truly sorry for speaking. Yes, I was right. Was I not? If I remove my shoes, I am allowed? Of course, but so few ladies take the trouble, especially of thinking no one is there to see. That makes no difference, God is here. Madam. Please let me go. Oh, can I do you some service now or at any time? No, thank you, really none, good night. May I know your name? She was now in the shadow of the gateway, so that he could not see her face, but she saw his, and she said with a change of voice, Mrs. Moore. Mrs. Advancing, he found that she was old. A fabric bigger than the mosque fell to pieces, and he did not know whether he was glad or sorry. She was older than Hamidullah Begum with a red face and white hair. Her voice had deceived him. Mrs. Moore, I am afraid I startled you. I shall tell my community, our friends, about you. That God is here, very good, very fine indeed. I think you are newly arrived in India. Yes. How did you know? By the way you address me. No, but can I call you a carriage? I have only come from the club. They are doing a play that I have seen in London, and it was so hot. What was the name of the play? Cousin Kate. I think you ought not to walk at night alone, Mrs. Moore. There are bad characters about and leopards may come across from the Marabar Hills. Snakes also. She exclaimed, she had forgotten the snakes, for example, a six-spot beetle, he continued, you pick it up, it bites, you die. But you walk about yourself. Oh, I am used to it. Used to snakes? They both laughed. I'm a doctor, he said. Snakes don't dare bite me. They sat down side by side in the entrance, and slipped on their evening shoes. Please may I ask you a question now? Why do you come to India at this time of year? just as the cold weather is ending. I intended to start earlier, 
but there was an unavoidable delay. It will soon be so unhealthy for you. And why ever do you come to Chandrapur? To visit my son. He is the city magistrate here. Oh no, excuse me, that is quite impossible. Our city magistrate's name is Mr. Heslop. I know him intimately. He's my son all the same, she said, smiling. But, Mrs. Moore, how can he be? I was married twice. Yes, now I see, and your first husband died. He did, and so did my second husband. Then we are in the same box, he said cryptically. Then is the city magistrate the entire of your family now? No, there are the younger ones, Ralph and Stella in England. And the gentleman here, is he Ralph and Stella's half-brother? Quite right. Mrs. Moore, this is all extremely strange because like yourself I have also two sons and a daughter. Is not this the same box with a vengeance? What are their names? Not also Ronnie, Ralph, and Stella, surely? The suggestion delighted him. No, indeed, how funny it sounds. Their names are quite different and will surprise you. Listen, please, I am about to tell you my children's names. The first is called Ahmed, the second is called Kareem. The third, she is the eldest, Jamla. Three children are enough. Do not you agree with me? I do. They were both silent for a little, thinking of their respective families. She sighed and rose to go. Would you care to see over the Minto hospital one morning? He inquired, I have nothing else to offer at Chandrapur. Thank you, I have seen it already, or I should have liked to come with you very much. I suppose the civil surgeon took you. Yes, and Mrs. Corlender. His voice altered. Ah, a very charming lady. Possibly, when one knows her better. What, what, you didn't like her? She was certainly intending to be kind, but I did not find her exactly charming. He burst out with, she has just taken my horse cart without my permission, do you call the being charming question mark and Major Callender interrupts me night after night from where I am dining with my friends and I go at once, breaking up a most pleasant entertainment and he is not there and not even a message. Is this charming, pray? But what does it matter? I can do nothing and he knows it. I am just a subordinate, my time is of no value. The balcony is good enough for an Indian. Yes, yes, let him stand, and Mrs. Corlender takes my carriage and cuts me dead. She listened, he was excited partly by his wrongs but much more by the knowledge that someone sympathized with them. It was this that led him to repeat, exaggerate, contradict. She had proved her sympathy by criticizing her fellow countrywoman to him, but even earlier he had known. The flame that not even beauty can nourish was springing up, and though his words were querulous his heart began to glow secretly. Presently it burst into speech. You understand me, you know what others feel. Oh, if others resembled you. Rather surprised, she replied, I don't think I understand people very well. I only know whether I like or dislike them. Then you are an oriental. She accepted his escort back to the club, and said at the gate that she wished she was a member, so that she could have asked him in. Indians are not allowed into the Chandra Poor Club even as guests, he said simply. He did not expatiate on his wrongs now, being happy, as he strolled downhill beneath the lovely moon, and again saw the lovely mosque. He seemed to own the land as much as anyone owned it. What did it matter if a few flabby Hindus had preceded him there, and a futurely English succeeded? Chapter 3
The third act of Cousin Kate was well advanced by the time Mrs. Moore entered the club, windows were barred, lest the servants should see their mistresses acting, and the heat was consequently immense. One electric fan revolved like a wounded bird, another was out of order. Disinclined to return to the audience, she went into the billiard room, where she was greeted by I want to see the real India, and her appropriate life came back with a rush. This was Adela Quested, the queer, cautious girl whom Ronnie had commissioned her to bring from England, and Ronnie was her son, also cautious, whom Miss Quested would probably though not certainly marry, and she herself was an elderly lady. I want to see it too, and I only wish we could. Apparently the Turtons will arrange something for next Tuesday. It'll end in an elephant ride, it always does. Look at this evening. Cousin Kate. Imagine, Cousin Kate. But where have you been off to? Did you succeed in catching the moon in the Ganges? The two ladies had happened, the night before, to see the moon's reflection in a distant channel of the stream. The water had drawn it out, so that it had seemed larger than the real moon, and brighter, which had pleased them. I went to the mosque, but I did not catch the moon. The angle would have altered, she rises later. Later and later, yawned Mrs. Moore, who was tired after her walk. Let me think, we don't see the other side of the moon out here, no. Come. India's not as bad as all that, said a pleasant voice. Other side of the earth, if you like, but we stick to the same old moon. Neither of them knew the speaker nor did they ever see him again. He passed with his friendly word through red brick pillars into the darkness. We aren't even seeing the other side of the world, that's our complaint, said Adila. Mrs. Moore agreed. She too was disappointed at the dullness of their new life. They had made such a romantic voyage across the Mediterranean and through the sands of Egypt to the harbour of Bombay, to find only a gridiron of bungalows at the end of it. But she did not take the disappointment as seriously as Miss Quest did, for the reason that she was forty years older and had learned that life never gives us what we want at the moment that we consider appropriate. Adventures do occur, but not punctually. She said again that she hoped that something interesting would be arranged for next Tuesday. Have a drink, said another pleasant voice. Mrs. Moore, Miss Quested, have a drink, of two drinks. They knew who it was this time, the collector, Mr. Turton with whom they had dined, like themselves, he had found the atmosphere of cousin Kate too hot, Ronnie, he told them, was stage managing in place of Major Corlender, whom some native subordinate or other had let down, and doing it very well, then he turned to Ronnie's other merits, and in quiet, decisive tones said much that was flattering. It wasn't that the young man was particularly good at the games or the lingo, or that he had much notion of the law, but, apparently a large but, Ronnie was dignified. Mrs. Moore was surprised to learn this, dignity not being a quality with which any mother credits her son. Miss Quested learnt it with anxiety for she had not decided whether she liked dignified men. She tried indeed to discuss this point with Mr. Turton, but he silenced her with a good-humoured motion of his hand, and continued what he had come to say. The long and the short of it is he's lopsus sahib, he's the type we want, he's one of us, and another civilian who was leaning over the billiard table said, here, here. The matter was thus placed beyond doubt, and the collector passed on, for other duties called him. Meanwhile the performance ended, and the amateur orchestra played the national anthem. Conversation and billiards stopped, 
faces stiffened. It was the anthem of the army of occupation. It reminded every member of the club that he or she was British and in exile. It produced a little sentiment and a useful accession of willpower. The meager tune, the curt series of demands on Jehovah, fused into a prayer unknown in England, and though they perceived neither royalty nor deity they did perceive something, they were strengthened to resist another day. Then they poured out, offering one another drinks, a dealer, have a drink, mother, a drink. They refused, they were weary of drinks, and misquested, who always said exactly what was in her mind, announced anew that she was desirous of seeing the real India. Ronnie was in high spirits. The request struck him as comic, and he called out to another passerby, Fielding. How's one to see the real India? Try seeing Indians, the man answered, and vanished. Who was that? Our schoolmaster, Government College. As if one could avoid seeing them, sighed Mrs. Leslie. I've avoided, said Miss Quested, accepting my own servant. I've scarcely spoken to an Indian since landing. Oh, lucky you. But I want to see them. She became the center of an amused group of ladies. One said, wanting to see Indians. How new that sounds. Another, natives. Why, fancy. A third, more serious, said, let me explain. Natives don't respect one any the more after meeting one, you see. That occurs after so many meetings. But the lady, entirely stupid and friendly, continued, what I mean is, I was a nurse before my marriage, and came across them a great deal, so I know. I really do know the truth about Indians. A most unsuitable position for any English woman, I was a nurse in a native state. One's only hope was to hold sternly aloof. Even from one's patients? Why, the kindest thing one can do to a native is to let him die, said Mrs. Corlender. How if he went to heaven? Asked Mrs. Moore, with a gentle but crooked smile. He can go where he likes as long as he doesn't come near me, they give me the creeps. As a matter of fact I have thought what you were saying about heaven, and that is why I am against missionaries, said the lady who had been a nurse. I am all for chaplains, but all against missionaries. Let me explain. But before she could do so, the collector intervened. Do you really want to meet the Aryan brother, Miss Quested? That can be easily fixed up. I didn't realize he'd amuse you. He thought a moment. You can practically see any type you like. Take your choice. I know the government people and the landowners, he's lop here can get hold of the barrister crew. While if you want to specialize on education, we can come down on fielding. I'm tired of seeing picturesque figures pass before me as a freeze, the girl explained. It was wonderful when we landed, but that superficial glamour soon goes. Her impressions were of no interest to the collector, he was only concerned to give her a good time. Would she like a bridge party? He explained to her what that was, not the game but a party to bridge the gulf between east and west, the expression was his own invention, and amused all who heard it. I only want those Indians whom you come across socially, as your friends. Well, we don't come across them socially, he said, laughing. They're full of all the virtues, but we don't, and it's now 11.30, and too late to go into the reasons. Miss Quested. What a name! remarked Mrs. Turton to her husband as they drove away. She had not taken to the new young lady, thinking her ungracious and cranky. She trusted that she hadn't been brought out to marry nice little Heslop, though it looked like it. 
Her husband agreed with her in his heart, but he never spoke against an English woman if he could avoid doing so, and he only said that Miss Quest had naturally made mistakes. He added, India does wonders for the judgment, especially during the hot weather, it has even done wonders for fielding. Mrs. Turton closed her eyes at this name and remarked that Mr. Fielding wasn't pucker, and had better marry Miss Quested, for she wasn't pucker. Then they reached their bungalow, low and enormous, the oldest and most uncomfortable bungalow in the civil station, with a sunk soup plate of a lawn, and they had one drink more, this time of barley water, and went to bed. Their withdrawal from the club had broken up the evening, which, like all gatherings, had an official tinge. A community that bows the knee to a viceroy and believes that the divinity that hedges a king can be transplanted, must feel some reverence for any viceregal substitute. At Chandrapur the Turtons were little gods, soon they would retire to some suburban villa and die exiled from glory. It's decent of the head sahib, chattered Ronnie, much gratified at the civility that had been shown to his guests. Do you know he's never given a bridge party before? Coming on top of the dinner too. I wish I could have arranged something myself, but when you know the natives better you'll realize it's easier for the head sahib than for me. They know him. They know he can't be fooled, I'm still fresh comparatively. No one can even begin to think of knowing this country until he has been in it twenty years. Hello, the mater. Here's your cloak. Well, for an example of the mistakes one makes. Soon after I came out I asked one of the pleaders to have a smoke with me, only a cigarette mind. I found afterwards that he had sent touts all over the bazaar to announce the fact, told all the litigants, oh, you'd better come to my Vakilma Maudali, he's in with the city magistrate. Ever since then I've dropped on him in court as hard as I could. It's taught me a lesson, and I hope him. Isn't the lesson that you should invite all the pleaders to have a smoke with you? Perhaps? but time's limited and the flesh weak. I prefer my smoke at the club amongst my own sort, I'm afraid. Why not ask the pleaders to the club? Miss Quested persisted. Not allowed. He was pleasant and patient, and evidently understood why she did not understand. He implied that he had once been a she, though not for long. Going to the balcony, he called firmly to the moon. His say answered, and without lowering his head, he ordered his trap to be brought round. Mrs. Moore, whom the club had stupefied, woke up outside. She watched the moon, whose radiance stained with primrose the purple of the surrounding sky. In England the moon had seemed dead and alien, here she was caught in the shawl of night together with earth and all the other stars. A sudden sense of unity, of kinship with the heavenly bodies, passed into the old woman and out, like water through a tank, leaving a strange freshness behind. She did not dislike Cousin Kate or the national anthem, but their note had died into a new one just as cocktails and cigars had died into invisible flowers. When the mosque, long and domeless, gleamed at the turn of the road, she exclaimed, Oh, yes, that's where I got to, that's where I've been. Been the when? asked her son, between the acts. But, mother, you can't do that sort of thing. Can't mother? she replied, No. Really not in this country. It's not done. There's the danger from snakes for one thing. They are apartment to lie out in the evening. Ah yes, so the young man there said. This sounds very romantic, said Miss Quested, who was exceedingly fond of Mrs. Moore, and was glad she should have had this little escapade. You meet a young man in a mosque, and then never let me know. I was going to tell you. Adela, 
but something changed the conversation and I forgot. My memory grows deplorable. Was he nice? She paused, then said emphatically, very nice. Who was he? Ronnie inquired. A doctor. I don't know his name. A doctor? I know of no young doctor in Chandrapur. How odd. What was he like? Rather small, with a little moustache and quick eyes. He called out to me when I was in the dark part of the mosque about my shoes. That was how we began talking. He was afraid I had them on, but I remembered luckily. He told me about his children, and then we walked back to the club. He knows you well. I wish you had pointed him out to me. I can't make out who he is. He didn't come into the club. He said he wasn't allowed to. Thereupon the truth struck him, and he cried oh, Good gracious, not a Mohammedan. Why ever didn't you tell me you'd been talking to a native? I was going all wrong. A Mohammedan. How perfectly magnificent! exclaimed Miss Quested. Ronnie, isn't that like your mother? While we talk about seeing the real India, she goes and sees it, and then forgets she's seen it. But Ronnie was ruffled, from his mother's description he had thought the doctor might be young Muggins from over the Ganges, and had brought out all the comradely emotions. What a mix-up, why hadn't she indicated by the tone of her voice that she was talking about an Indian? Scratchy and dictatorial, he began to question her. He called to you in the mosque. Did he? How? Impudently? What was he doing there himself at that time of night? Question mark. No, it's not their prayer time. This in answer to a suggestion of Miss Quested's, who showed the keenest interest. So he called to you over your shoes. Then it was impudence. It's an old trick. I wish you had had them on. I think it was impudence, but I don't know about a trick said Mrs. Moore, his nerves were all on edge, I could tell from his voice, as soon as I answered he altered, you oughtn't to have answered, now look here, said the logical girl, wouldn't you expect a Mohammedan to answer if you asked him to take off his hat in church, it's different, it's different, you don't understand, I know I don't, and I want to. What is the difference? Please. He wished she wouldn't interfere. His mother did not signify. She was just a globetrotter, a temporary escort, who could retire to England with what impressions she chose. But a dealer, who meditated spending her life in the country, was a more serious matter. It would be tiresome if she started crooked over the native question. Pulling up the mare, he said, there's your Ganges. Their attention was diverted. Below them a radiance had suddenly appeared. It belonged neither to water nor moonlight, but stood like a luminous sheaf upon the fields of darkness. He told them that it was where the new sandbank was forming and that the dark raveled bit at the top was the sand, and that the dead bodies floated down that way from Ben Ayres, or would if the crocodiles let them. It's not much of a dead body that gets down to Chandrapur. Crocodiles down in it too, how terrible. His mother murmured, the young people glanced at each other and smiled, it amused them when the old lady got these gentle creeps and harmony was restored between them consequently. She continued, what a terrible river. What a wonderful river. And sighed. The radiance was already altering, whether through shifting of the moon or of the sand, soon the bright sheaf would be gone, and a circlet, itself to alter, be burnished upon the streaming void. The women discussed whether they would wait for the change or not while the silence broke into patches of unquietness and the mare shivered. On her account they did not wait, but drove on to the city magistrate's bungalow, where Ms. Quested went to bed.
and Mrs. Moore had a short interview with her son. He wanted to inquire about the Mohammedan doctor in the mosque. It was his duty to report suspicious characters and conceivably it was some disreputable Hakim who had prowled up from the bazaar. When she told him that it was someone connected with the Minto hospital, he was relieved, and said that the fellow's name must be Aziz, and that he was quite all right. Nothing against him at all, Aziz. What a charming name. So you and he had a talk. Did you gather he was well disposed? Ignorant of the force of this question, she replied, yes, quite, after the first moment. I meant, generally, did he seem to tolerate us, the brutal conqueror, the sun-dried bureaucrat, that sort of thing? Oh, yes. I think so, except the call enders, he doesn't care for the call enders at all. Oh, so he told you that, did he? The major will be interested. I wonder what was the aim of the remark. Ronnie, Ronnie. You're never going to pass it on to major call ender. Yes, rather, I must, in fact. But, my dear boy. If the Major heard I was disliked by any native subordinate of mine, I should expect him to pass it on to me. But, my dear boy, a private conversation. Nothing's private in India. Aziz knew that when he spoke out, so don't you worry. He had some motive in what he said. My personal belief is that the remark wasn't true. How not true? He abused the Major in order to impress you. I don't know what you mean, dear. It's the educated native's latest dodge. They used to cringe, but the younger generation believe in a show of manly independence. They think it will pay better with the itinerant MP. But whether the native swaggers or cringes, there's always something behind every remark he makes. Always something and if nothing else he's trying to increase his respect, in plain Anglo-Saxon, to score. Of course there are exceptions. You never used to judge people like this at home. India isn't home, he retorted, rather rudely, but in order to silence her he had been using phrases and arguments that he had picked up from older officials, and he did not feel quite sure of himself. When he said of course there are exceptions he was quoting Mr. Turton, while increasing the respect was Major Call Ender's own. The phrases worked and were in current use at the club, but she was rather clever at detecting the first from the second hand, and might press him for definite examples. She only said, I can't deny that what you say sounds very sensible. But you really must not hand on to Major Call Ender anything I have told you about Dr. Aziz. He felt disloyal to his caste, but he promised, adding, in return please don't talk about Aziz to a dealer. Not talk about him? Why? There you go again, mother, I really can't explain everything. I don't want a dealer to be worried, that's the fact. She'll begin wondering whether we treat the natives properly, and all that sort of nonsense. But she came out to be worried, that's exactly why she's here. She discussed it all on the boat. We had a long talk when we went on shore at Aden. She knows you in play, as she put it, but not in work, and she felt she must come and look round, before she decided, and before you decided, she is very very fair-minded. I know, he said dejectedly. The note of anxiety in his voice made her feel that he was still a little boy, who must have what he liked, so she promised to do as he wished, and they kissed goodnight. He had not forbidden her to think about Aziz, however, and she did this when she retired to her room. In the light of her son's comment she reconsidered the scene at the mosque, to see whose impression was correct. Yes, it could be worked into quite an unpleasant scene. The doctor had begun by bullying her, had said Mrs. Callender was nice, and then, 
finding the ground safe, had changed, he had alternately whined over his grievances and patronized her, had run a dozen ways in a single sentence, had been unreliable, inquisitive, vain. Yes, it was all true, but how false as a summary of the man, the essential life of him had been slain. Going to hang up her cloak, she found that the tip of the peg was occupied by a small wasp. She had known this wasp or his relatives by day, they were not as English wasps, but had long yellow legs which hung down behind when they flew. Perhaps he mistook the peg for a branch, no Indian animal has any sense of an interior. Bats, rats, birds, insects will as soon nest inside a house as out, it is to them a normal growth of the eternal jungle, which alternately produces houses trees, houses trees. There he clung, asleep, while jackals in the plain bade their desires and mingled with the percussion of drums. Pretty dear, said Mrs. Moore to the wasp. He did not wake, but her voice floated out to swell a night's uneasiness. Chapter 4 The Collector Kept His Word Next day he issued invitation cards to numerous Indian gentlemen in the neighborhood, stating that he would be at home in the garden of the club between the hours of 5 and 7 on the following Tuesday, also that Mrs. Turton would be glad to receive any ladies of their families who were out of veiled. His action caused much excitement and was discussed in several worlds. It is owing to orders from the LG, was Mahmoud Ali's explanation. Turton would never do this unless compelled. Those high officials are different, they sympathize, the viceroy sympathizes, they would have us treated properly. But they come too seldom and live too far away. Meanwhile, it is easy to sympathize at a distance, said an old gentleman with a beard. I value more the kind word that is spoken close to my ear. Mr. Turton has spoken it, from whatever cause. He speaks, we hear. I do not see why we need discuss it further. Quotations followed from the Quran. We have not all your sweet nature, nor wabuhada, nor your learning. The lieutenant governor may be my very good friend, but I give him no trouble. How do you do? Nawab had a question mark. Quite well, thank you, Sir Gilbert. How are you? Question mark and all is over, but I can be a thorn in Mr. Turton's flesh, and if he asks me, I accept the invitation. I shall come in from Dilkush or specially, though I have to postpone other business. You will make yourself chip, suddenly said a little black man. There was a stir of disapproval. Who is this ill-bred upstart, that he should criticize the leading Mohammedan landowner of the district? Muhammad Ali, though sharing his opinion, felt bound to oppose it. Mr. Amchand, he said, swaying forward stiffly with his hands on his hips. Mr. Muhammad Ali. Mr. Amchand. The Nawab Hadda can decide what is cheap without our valuation, I think. I do not expect I shall make myself cheap, said the Nawab Hadda to Mr. Amchand, speaking very pleasantly, for he was aware that the man had been impolite and he desired to shield him from the consequences. It had passed through his mind to reply, I expect I shall make myself cheap but he rejected this as the less courteous alternative. I do not see why we should make ourselves cheap. I do not see why we should. The invitation is worded very graciously. Feeling that he could not further decrease the social gulf between himself and his auditors, he sent his elegant grandison, who was in attendance on him, to fetch his car. When it came, he repeated all that he had said before, though at greater length, ending up with till Tuesday, then, gentlemen all, when I hope we may meet in the flower gardens of the club. This opinion carried great weight. The Nawab Hadda was a big proprietor and a philanthropist, 
a man of benevolence and decision. His character among all the communities in the province stood high. He was a straightforward enemy and a staunch friend, and his hospitality was proverbial. Give, do not lend, after death who will thank you? was his favorite remark. He held it a disgrace to die rich. When such a man was prepared to motor 25 miles to shake the collector's hand, the entertainment took another aspect. For he was not like some eminent men, who give out that they will come, and then fail at the last moment, leaving the small fry floundering. If he said he would come, he would come he would never deceive his supporters. The gentleman whom he had lectured now urged one another to attend the party, although convinced at heart that his advice was unsound. He had spoken in the little room near the courts where the pleaders waited for clients, clients, waiting for pleaders, sat in the dust outside. These had not received a card from Mr. Turton, and there were circles even beyond these, People who wore nothing but a loincloth, people who wore not even that, and spent their lives in knocking two sticks together before a scarlet doll, humanity grading and drifting beyond the educated vision, until no earthly invitation can embrace it. All invitations must proceed from heaven perhaps, perhaps it is futile for men to initiate their own unity, they do but widen the gulfs between them by the attempt. So at all events thought old Mr. Graceford and young Mr. Sawley, the devoted missionaries who lived out beyond the slaughterhouses, always travelled third on the railways, and never came up to the club. In our father's house are many mansions, they taught and there alone will the incompatible multitudes of mankind be welcomed and soothed, not one shall be turned away by the servants on that balcony, be he black or white, not one shall be kept standing who approaches with a loving heart. And why should the divine hospitality cease here, consider, with all reverence, the monkeys. May there not be a mansion for the monkeys also? Old Mr. Graceford said no, but young Mr. Sawley, who was advanced, said yes. He saw no reason why monkeys should not have their collateral share of bliss, and he had sympathetic discussions about them with his Hindu friends. And the jackals? Jackals were indeed less to Mr. Sawley's mind but he admitted that the mercy of God, being infinite, may well embrace all mammals, and the wasps, he became uneasy during the descent to wasps, and was apartment to change the conversation, and oranges, cactuses, crystals and mud, and the bacteria inside Mr. Sawley, no, no, this is going too far, we must exclude someone from our gathering, or we shall be left with nothing. Chapter 5 The bridge party was not a success, at least it was not what Mrs. Moore and Ms. Quested were accustomed to consider a successful party. They arrived early, since it was given in their honor, but most of the Indian guests had arrived even earlier, and stood massed at the farther side of the tennis lawns, doing nothing. It is only just five, said Mrs. Turton. My husband will be up from his office in a moment and start the thing. I have no idea what we have to do. It's the first time we've ever given a party like this at the club. Mr. Heaslop, when I'm dead and gone will you give parties like this? It's enough to make the old type of head side turn in his grave. Ronnie laughed deferentially. You wanted something not picturesque and we've provided it, he remarked to Miss Quested. What do you think of the Aryan brother in a cap and spats? Neither she nor his mother answered. They were gazing rather sadly over the tennis lawn. No, it was not picturesque, the East, abandoning its secular magnificence was descending into a valley whose farther side no man can see. The great point to remember is that no one who's here matters, 
those who matter don't come. Isn't that so, Mrs. Turton? Absolutely true, said the great lady, leaning back. She was saving herself up, as she called it, not for anything that would happen that afternoon or even that week but for some vague future occasion when a high official might come along and tax her social strength. Most of her public appearances were marked by this air of reserve. Assured of her approbation, Ronnie continued, The educated Indians will be no good to us if there's a row, it's simply not worth while conciliating them. That's why they don't matter. Most of the people you see are seditious at heart, and the rest L.D. run squealing. The cultivator, he's another story. The parthen, he's a man if you like. But these people, don't imagine they're India. He pointed to the dusky line beyond the court, and here and there it flashed a pince-nez or shuffled a shoe, as if aware that he was despising it. European costume had lighted like a leprosy. Few had yielded entirely, but none were untouched. There was a silence when he had finished speaking, on both sides of the court, at least, more ladies joined the English group, but their words seemed to die as soon as uttered. Some kites hovered overhead, impartial, over the kites passed the mass of a vulture, and with an impartiality exceeding all, the sky, not deeply colored but translucent, poured light from its whole circumference, it seemed unlikely that the series stopped here, beyond the sky must not there be something that overarches all the skies, more impartial even than they, beyond which again, they spoke of cousin Kate, they had tried to reproduce their own attitude to life upon the stage, and to dress up as the middle class English people they actually were. Next year they would do Quality Street or the Yeoman of the Guard. Save for this annual incursion, they left literature alone. The men had no time for it, the women did nothing that they could not share with the men. Their ignorance of the arts was notable, and they lost no opportunity of proclaiming it to one another, it was the public school attitude flourishing more vigorously than it can yet hope to do in England. If Indians were shop, the arts were bad form, and Ronnie had repressed his mother when she inquired after his viola, a viola was almost a demerit, and certainly not the sort of instrument one mentioned in public. She noticed now how tolerant and conventional his judgments had become, when they had seen cousin Kate in London together in the past, he had scorned it, now he pretended that it was a good play, in order to hurt nobody's feelings, an unkind notice had appeared in the local paper, the sort of thing no white man could have written, as Mrs. Leslie said, the play was praised, to be sure, and so were the stage management and the performance as a whole, but the notice contained the following sentence, Miss Derrick, though she charmingly looked her part, lacked the necessary experience, and occasionally forgot her words. This tiny breath of genuine criticism had given deep offence, not indeed to Miss Derrick, who was as hard as nails, but to her friends. Miss Derrick did not belong to Chandra Poor. She was stopping for a fortnight with the McBrides, the police people, and she had been so good as to fill up a gap in the cast at the last moment. A nice impression of local hospitality she would carry away with her. To work, Mary, to work, cried the collector, touching his wife on the shoulder with the switch. Mrs. Turton got up awkwardly. What do you want me to do? Oh, those veiled women. I never thought any would come. Oh dear. A little group of Indian ladies had been gathering in a third quarter of the grounds, near a rustic summer house in which the more timid of them had already taken refuge. The rest stood with their backs to the company and their faces pressed into a bank of shrubs. At a little distance stood their male relatives, 
watching the venture. The site was significant, an island bared by the turning tide, and bound to grow. I consider they ought to come over to me. Come along, Mary, get it over. I refuse to shake hands with any of the men, unless it has to be the Nawabahada. Whom have we so far? He glanced along the line, H.M. H.M. Much as one expected. We know why he's here, I think, over that contract, and he wants to get the right side of me for Moharam, and he's the astrologer who wants to dodge the municipal building regulations, and he's that Parsi, and he's, hello. There he goes, smash into our hollyhocks. Pulled the left rein when he meant the right, all as usual. They ought never to have been allowed to drive in, it's so bad for them, said Mrs. Turton, who had at last begun her progress to the summer house, accompanied by Mrs. Moore, Miss Quested, and a terrier. Why they come at all I don't know, they hate it as much as we do. Talk to Mrs. McBride. Her husband made her give veiled parties until she struck. This isn't a veiled party, corrected Miss Quested. Oh, really, was the haughty rejoinder. Do kindly tell us who these ladies are, asked Mrs. Moore. You're superior to them, anyway. Don't forget that. You're superior to everyone in India except one or two of the Rannies, and they're on an equality. Advancing, she shook hands with the group and said a few words of welcome in Urdu. She had learned the lingo, but only to speak to her servants, so she knew none of the politer forms and of the verbs only the imperative mood. As soon as her speech was over, she inquired of her companions, is that what you wanted? Please tell these ladies that I wish we could speak their language but we have only just come to their country. Perhaps we speak yours a little, one of the ladies said. Why, fancy, she understands, said Mrs. Turton. Eastbourne, Piccadilly, High Park Corner, said another of the ladies. Oh yes, they're English speaking. But now we can talk, how delightful, cried Adela, her face lighting up. She knows Paris also, called one of the onlookers. They pass Paris on the way, no doubt, said Mrs. Turton, as if she was describing the movements of migratory birds. Her manner had grown more distant since she had discovered that some of the group was westernized, and might apply her own standards to her. The shorter lady, she is my wife, she is Mrs. Batacharia. The onlooker explained. The taller lady, she is my sister, she is Mrs. Duss. The shorter and the taller ladies both adjusted their saris, and smiled. There was a curious uncertainty about their gestures, as if they sought for a new formula which neither East nor West could provide. When Mrs. Batacharia's husband spoke, she turned away from him but she did not mind seeing the other men. Indeed all the ladies were uncertain, cowering, recovering, giggling, making tiny gestures of atonement or despair at all that was said, and alternately fondling the terrier or shrinking from him. Miss Quested now had her desired opportunity, friendly Indians were before her, and she tried to make them talk, but she failed. She strove in vain against the echoing walls of their civility. Whatever she said produced a murmur of deprecation, varying into a murmur of concern when she dropped her pocket handkerchief. She tried doing nothing, to see what that produced, and they too did nothing. Mrs. Moore was equally unsuccessful. Mrs. Turton waited for them with a detached expression. She had known what nonsense it all was from the first. When they took their leave, Mrs. Moore had an impulse, and said to Mrs. Batacharia, whose face she liked, I wonder whether you would allow us to call on you some day. When? She replied, inclining charmingly, whenever is convenient. 
All days are convenient. Thursday. Most certainly. We shall enjoy it greatly, it would be a real pleasure. What about the time? All hours. Tell us which you would prefer. We're quite strangers to your country, we don't know when you have visitors, said Miss Quested. Mrs. Batacheria seemed not to know either, her gesture implied that she had known, since Thursdays began, that English ladies would come to see her on one of them, and so always stayed in. Everything pleased her, nothing surprised. She added, we leave for Calcutta today. Oh, do you? said Adela, not at first seeing the implication. Then she cried, oh, but if you do we shall find you gone. Mrs. Batacheria did not dispute it. But her husband called from the distance, yes, yes, you come to us Thursday. But you'll be in Calcutta. No, no, we shall not. He said something swiftly to his wife in Bengali. We expect you Thursday. Thursday. The woman echoed, You can't have done such a dreadful thing as to put off going for our sake? exclaimed Mrs. Moore. No, of course not, we are not such people. He was laughing. I believe that you have. Oh, please, it distresses me beyond words. Everyone was laughing now, but with no suggestion that they had blundered. A shapeless discussion occurred, during which Mrs. Turton retired, smiling to herself. The upshot was that they were to come Thursday, but early in the morning, so as to wreck the Batacheria plans as little as possible, and Mr. Batacheria would send his carriage to fetch them with servants to point out the way. Did he know where they lived? Yes, of course he knew, he knew everything, and he laughed again. They left among a flutter of compliments and smiles, and three ladies, who had hitherto taken no part in the reception, suddenly shot out of the summer house like exquisitely coloured swallows and salamed them. Meanwhile the collector had been going his rounds. He made pleasant remarks and a few jokes, which were applauded lustily, but he knew something to the discredit of nearly every one of his guests, and was consequently perfunctory. When they had not cheated, it was bang, women, or worse, and even the desirables wanted to get something out of him. He believed that a bridge party did good rather than harm, or he would not have given one, but he was under no illusions, and at the proper moment he retired to the English side of the lawn. The impressions he left behind him were various. Many of the guests, especially the humbler and less anglicized, were genuinely grateful. To be addressed by so high an official was a permanent asset. They did not mind how long they stood, or how little happened, and when seven o'clock struck, they had to be turned out. Others were grateful with more intelligence. The Nawab Hadda, indifferent for himself and for the distinction with which he was greeted, was moved by the mere kindness that must have prompted the invitation. He knew the difficulties. Hamidullah also thought that the collector had played up well, but others, such as Muhammad Ali, were cynical. They were firmly convinced that Turton had been made to give the party by his official superiors and was all the time consumed with impotent rage, and they infected some who were inclined to a healthier view. Yet even Muhammad Ali was glad he had come. Shrines are fascinating especially when rarely opened, and it amused him to note the ritual of the English club, and to caricature it afterwards to his friends, after Mr. Turton. The official who did his duty best was Mr. Fielding, the principal of the little government college. He knew little of the district and less against the inhabitants, so he was in a less cynical state of mind. Athletic and cheerful, he romped about making numerous mistakes which the parents of his pupils tried to cover up, for he was popular among them. When the moment for refreshments came, 
he did not move back to the English side, but burnt his mouth with gram. He talked to anyone and he ate anything. Amid much that was alien, he learned that the two new ladies from England had been a great success, and that their politeness in wishing to be Mrs. Bhattacharya's guests had pleased not only her but all Indians who heard of it. It pleased Mr. Fielding also. He scarcely knew the two new ladies, still he decided to tell them what pleasure they had given by their friendliness. He found the younger of them alone. She was looking through a nick in the cactus hedge at the distant Marabar hills, which had crept near, as was their custom at sunset. If the sunset had lasted long enough, they would have reached the town, but it was swift, being tropical. He gave her his information and she was so much pleased and thanked him so heartily that he asked her and the other lady to tea. He'll like to come very much indeed, and so would Mrs. Moore, I know. I'm rather a hermit, you know. Much the best thing to be in this place. Owing to my work and so on, I don't get up much to the club. I know, I know, and we never get down from it. I envy you being with Indians. Do you care to meet one or two? Very, very much indeed, it's what I long for. This party today makes me so angry and miserable. I think my countrymen out here must be mad. Fancy inviting guests and not treating them properly. You and Mr. Turton and perhaps Mr. McBride are the only people who showed any common politeness. The rest make me perfectly ashamed, and it's got worse and worse. It had. The Englishman had intended to play up better, but had been prevented from doing so by their women folk, whom they had to attend, provide with tea, advise about dogs, etc. When tennis began, the barrier grew impenetrable. It had been hoped to have some sets between East and West, but this was forgotten and the courts were monopolized by the usual club couples. Fielding resented it too, but did not say so to the girl, for he found something theoretical in her outburst. Did she care about Indian music? He inquired, there was an old professor down at the college, who sang, Oh, just what we wanted to hear. And do you know Dr. Aziz? I know all about him. I don't know him. Would you like him asked too? Mrs. Moore says he is so nice. Very well, Miss Quested. Will Thursday suit you? Indeed it will, and that morning we go to this Indian ladies. All the nice things are coming Thursday. I won't ask the city magistrate to bring you. I know he'll be busy at that time. Yes. Ronnie is always hard worked, she replied, contemplating the hills. How lovely they suddenly were. But she couldn't touch them. In front, like a shutter, fell a vision of her married life. She and Ronnie would look into the club like this every evening, then drive home to dress. They would see the Leslies and the Corlenders and the Turtons and the Burtons, and invite them and be invited by them while the true India slid by unnoticed. Color would remain. The pageant of birds in the early morning, brown bodies, white turbans, idols whose flesh was scarlet or blue, and movement would remain as long as there were crowds in the bazaar and bathers in the tanks. Perched up on the seat of a dog cart, she would see them. But the force that lies behind color and movement would escape her even more effectually than it did now. She would see India always as a freeze, never as a spirit, and she assumed that it was a spirit of which Mrs. Moore had had a glimpse. And sure enough they did drive away from the club in a few minutes, and they did dress, and to dinner came Miss Derrick and the McBrides, and the menu was, Julienne soup full of bolty bottled peas, pseudo cottage bread, fish full of branching bones, pretending to be place, more bottled peas with the cutlets, trifle, sardines on toast, 
the menu of Anglo-India, a dish might be added or subtracted as one rose or fell in the official scale. The peas might rattle less or more, the sardines and the vermouth be imported by a different firm, but the tradition remained, the food of exiles, cooked by servants who did not understand it, Adela thought of the young men and women who had come out before her, P and O, full after P and O, full, and had been set down to the same food and the same ideas, and been snubbed in the same good human way until they kept to the accredited themes and began to snub others. I should never get like that, she thought, for she was young herself, all the same she knew that she had come up against something that was both insidious and tough, and against which she needed allies. She must gather around her at Chandrapur a few people who felt as she did, and she was glad to have met Mr. Fielding and the Indian lady with the unpronounceable name. Here at all events was a nucleus, she should know much better where she stood in the course of the next two days. Miss Derrick, she companioned a Maharani in a remote native state. She was genial and gay and made them all laugh about her leave, which she had taken because she felt she deserved it, not because the Maharani said she might go. Now she wanted to take the Maharaja's motor car as well, it had gone to a chief's conference at Delhi and she had a great scheme for burgling it at the junction as it came back in the train. She was also very funny about the bridge party, indeed she regarded the entire peninsula as a comic opera. If one couldn't see the laughable side of these people one LD be done for, said Miss Derrick. Mrs. McBride, it was she who had been the nurse, ceased not to exclaim, Oh, Nancy! how topping, oh, Nancy, how killing, I wish I could look at things like that, Mr. McBride did not speak much, he seemed nice, when the guests had gone, and Adela gone to bed, there was another interview between mother and son, he wanted her advice and support, while resenting interference, does Adela talk to you much, he began, I'm so driven with work, I don't see her as much as I hoped, but I hope she finds things comfortable. Adela and I talk mostly about India. Dear, since you mention it, you're quite right. You ought to be more alone with her than you are. Yes, perhaps. But then people would gossip. Well, they must gossip sometime. Let them gossip. People are so odd out here, and it's not like home. One's always facing the footlights, as the head sahib said. Take a silly little example, when Adela went out to the boundary of the club compound, and Fielding followed her. I saw Mrs. Corlander notice it. They notice everything, until they're perfectly sure you're their sort. I don't think Adela will ever be quite their sort, she's much too individual. I know. That's so remarkable about her, he said thoughtfully. Mrs. Moore thought him rather absurd. Accustomed to the privacy of London, she could not realize that India, seemingly so mysterious, contains none, and that consequently the conventions have greater force. I suppose nothing's on her mind, he continued. Ask her, ask her yourself, my dear boy. Probably she's heard tales of the heat, but of course I should pack her off to the hills every April, I'm not one to keep a wife grilling in the plains. Oh, it wouldn't be the weather. There's nothing in India but the weather, my dear mother, it's the alpha and omega of the whole affair. Yes, as Mr. McBride was saying, but it's much more the Anglo-Indians themselves who are likely to get on Adela's nerves. She doesn't think they behave pleasantly to Indians, you see. What did I tell you? He exclaimed, losing his gentle manner. I knew it last week. Oh, how like a woman to worry over a side issue. She forgot about Adela in her surprise. A side issue? 
she repeated, how can it be that? We're not out here for the purpose of behaving pleasantly. What do you mean? What I say, we're out here to do justice and keep the peace. These are my sentiments. India isn't a drawing room. Your sentiments are those of a god, she said quietly, but it was his manner rather than his sentiments that annoyed her. Trying to recover his temper, he said, India likes gods. And Englishmen like posing as gods. There's no point in all this. Here we are, and we're going to stop, and the country's got to put up with us, gods or no gods. Oh, look here, he broke out, rather pathetically, what do you and Adela want me to do? Go against my class, against all the people I respect and admire out here, lose such power as I have for doing good in this country because my behavior isn't pleasant. You neither of you understand what work is, or you I would never talk such eyewash. I hate talking like this, but one must occasionally. It's morbidly sensitive to go on as a dealer and you do. I noticed you both at the club today. After the head sahib had been at all this trouble to amuse you, I am out here to work, mind, to hold this wretched country by force. I'm not a missionary or a labor member or a vague sentimental sympathetic literary man. I'm just a servant of the government, it's the profession you wanted me to choose myself, and that's that. We're not pleasant in India and we don't intend to be pleasant. We've something more important to do. He spoke sincerely. Every day he worked hard in the court trying to decide which of two untrue accounts was the less untrue, trying to dispense justice fearlessly, to protect the weak against the less weak, the incoherent against the plausible surrounded by lies and flattery. That morning he had convicted a railway clerk of overcharging pilgrims for their tickets, and a parthen of attempted rape. He expected no gratitude, no recognition for this, and both clerk and parthen might appeal, bribe their witnesses more effectually in the interval, and get their sentences reversed. It was his duty but he did expect sympathy from his own people, and except from newcomers he obtained it. He did think he ought not to be worried about bridge parties when the day's work was over and he wanted to play tennis with his equals or rest his legs upon a long chair. He spoke sincerely, but she could have wished with less gusto. How Ronnie reveled in the drawbacks of his situation, how he did rub it in that he was not in India to behave pleasantly, and derived positive satisfaction therefrom. He reminded her of his public school days. The traces of young man humanitarianism had sloughed off, and he talked like an intelligent and embittered boy. His words without his voice might have impressed her but when she heard the self-satisfied lilt of them, when she saw the mouth moving so complacently and competently beneath the little red nose, she felt, quite illogically, that this was not the last word on India. One touch of regret, not the canny substitute but the true regret from the heart, would have made him a different man and the British Empire a different institution. I'm going to argue and indeed dictate, she said, clinking her rings. The English are out here to be pleasant. How do you make that out, mother? He asked, speaking gently again, for he was ashamed of his irritability. Because India is part of the earth, and God has put us on the earth in order to be pleasant to each other. God is love. She hesitated, seeing how much he disliked the argument, but something made her go on. God has put us on earth to love our neighbors and to show it, and he is omnipresent, even in India, to see how we are succeeding. He looked gloomy, and a little anxious. He knew this religious strain in her, and that it was a symptom of bad health. There had been much of it when his stepfather died. He thought, she is certainly aging, 
and I ought not to be vexed with anything she says. The desire to behave pleasantly satisfies God. The sincere if impotent desire wins his blessing. I think everyone fails, but there are so many kinds of failure. Goodwill and more goodwill and more goodwill, though I speak with the tongues of. He waited until she had done, and then said gently, I quite see that. I suppose I ought to get off to my files now, and you'll be going to bed. I suppose so, I suppose so. They did not part for a few minutes, but the conversation had become unreal since Christianity had entered it. Ronnie approved of religion as long as it endorsed the national anthem, but he objected when it attempted to influence his life. Then he would say in respectful yet decided tones, I don't think it does to talk about these things. Every fellow has to work out his own religion, and any fellow who heard him muttered, here. Mrs. Moore felt that she had made a mistake in mentioning God, but she found him increasingly difficult to avoid as she grew older, and he had been constantly in her thoughts since she entered India, though oddly enough he satisfied her less. She must needs pronounce his name frequently, as the greatest she knew yet she had never found it less efficacious. Outside the arch there seemed always an arch, beyond the remotest echo a silence, and she regretted afterwards that she had not kept to the real serious subject that had caused her to visit India, namely the relationship between Ronnie and Adela. Would they, or would they not, succeed in becoming engaged to be married? Chapter 6 Aziz had not gone to the bridge party. Immediately after his meeting with Mrs. Moore he was diverted to other matters. Several surgical cases came in, and kept him busy. He ceased to be either outcast or poet, and became the medical student, very gay, and full of details of operations which he poured into the shrinking ears of his friends. His profession fascinated him at times, but he required it to be exciting, and it was his hand, not his mind, that was scientific. The knife he loved and used skillfully, and he also liked pumping in the latest serums. But the boredom of regime and hygiene repelled him, and after inoculating a man for enteric, he would go away and drink unfiltered water himself. What can you expect from the fellow? said the or major call ender. No grits, no guts. But in his heart he knew that if Aziz and not he had operated last year on Mrs. Graceford's appendix, the old lady would probably have lived. And this did not dispose him any better towards his subordinate. There was a row the morning after the mosque. They were always having rows. The major, who had been up half the night, wanted damn well to know why Aziz had not come promptly when summoned. Sir, excuse me, I did. I mounted my bike and it bust in front of the cow hospital. So I had to find a horse cart. Bust in front of the cow hospital, did it? And how did you come to be there? I beg your pardon? Oh Lord, oh Lord. When I live here he kicked the gravel, and you live the, not ten minutes from me, and the cow hospital is right, ever so far away the other side of you, there. Then how did you come to be passing the cow hospital on the way to me? Now do some work for a change. He strode away in a temper, without waiting for the excuse, which as far as it went was a sound one, the cow hospital was in a straight line between Hamidullah's house and his own, so Aziz had naturally passed it. He never realized that the educated Indians visited one another constantly and were weaving, however painfully, a new social fabric cast or something of the sort would prevent them. He only knew that no one ever told him the truth, 
Although he had been in the country for twenty years, Aziz watched him go with amusement. When his spirits were up he felt that the English are a comic institution, and he enjoyed being misunderstood by them, but it was an amusement of the emotions and nerves, which an accident or the passage of time might destroy, it was apart from the fundamental gaiety that he reached when he was with those whom he trusted. A disobliging simile involving Mrs. Callender occurred to his fancy. I must tell that to Muhammad Ali, it'll make him laugh, he thought. Then he got to work. He was competent and indispensable and he knew it. The simile passed from his mind while he exercised his professional skill. During these pleasant and busy days, he heard vaguely that the collector was giving a party, and that the Nawab had said everyone ought to go to it. His fellow assistant, Dr. Panalal, was in ecstasies at the prospect and was urgent that they should attend it together in his new tum-tum. The arrangement suited them both. Aziz was spared the indignity of a bicycle or the expense of hiring, while Dr. Panalal, who was timid and elderly, secured someone who could manage his horse. He could manage it himself, but only just, and he was afraid of the motors and of the unknown turn into the club grounds. Disaster may come, he said politely, but we shall at all events get there safe, even if we do not get back. And with more logic, it will, I think, create a good impression should two doctors arrive at the same time. But when the time came, Aziz was seized with a revulsion, and determined not to go. For one thing his spell of work, lately concluded, left him independent and healthy. For another, the day chanced to fall on the anniversary of his wife's death. She had died soon after he had fallen in love with her, he had not loved her at first. Touched by western feeling, he disliked union with a woman whom he had never seen, moreover, when he did see her, she disappointed him and he begat his first child in mere animality, the change began after its birth, he was won by her love for him, by a loyalty that implied something more than submission, and by her efforts to educate herself against that lifting of the veil that would come in the next generation if not in theirs. She was intelligent, yet had old-fashioned grace. Gradually he lost the feeling that his relatives had chosen wrongly for him. Sensuous enjoyment, well, even if he had it, it would have dulled in a year, and he had gained something instead which seemed to increase the longer they lived together. She became the mother of a son and in giving him a second son she died. Then he realized what he had lost, and that no woman could ever take her place. A friend would come nearer to her than another woman. She had gone, there was no one like her, and what is that uniqueness but love? He amused himself, he forgot her at times but at other times he felt that she had sent all the beauty and joy of the world into paradise, and he meditated suicide. Would he meet her beyond the tomb? Is there such a meeting place? Though orthodox, he did not know, God's unity was indubitable and indubitably announced, but on all other points he wavered like the average Christian, his belief in the life to come would pale to a hope vanish, reappear, all in a single sentence or a dozen heartbeats, so that the corpuscles of his blood rather than he seemed to decide which opinion he should hold, and for how long. It was so with all his opinions. Nothing stayed, nothing passed that did not return, the circulation was ceaseless and kept him young, and he mourned his wife the more sincerely because he mourned her seldom. It would have been simpler to tell Dr. Lau that he had changed his mind about the party, but until the last minute he did not know that he had changed it, indeed, he didn't change it, it changed itself. Unconquerable aversion welled. Mrs. Corlender, Mrs. Leslie, no, he couldn't stand them in his sorrow, 
they would guess it, for he dowered the British matron with strange insight, and would delight in torturing him, they would mock him to their husbands. When he should have been ready, he stood at the post office, writing a telegram to his children, and found on his return that Dr. Lal had called for him, and gone on. Well, let him go on, as befitted the coarseness of his nature. For his own part, he would commune with the dead, and unlocking a drawer, he took out his wife's photograph. He gazed at it, and tears spouted from his eyes. He thought, how unhappy I am. But because he really was unhappy, another emotion soon mingled with his self-pity. He desired to remember his wife and could not. Why could he remember people whom he did not love? They were always so vivid to him, whereas the more he looked at this photograph, the less he saw. She had eluded him thus, ever since they had carried her to her tomb. He had known that she would pass from his hands and eyes, but had thought she could live in his mind, not realizing that the very fact that we have loved the dead increases their unreality, and that the more passionately we invoke them the further they recede. A piece of brown cardboard and three children, that was all that was left of his wife. It was unbearable, and he thought again, how unhappy I am and became happier. He had breathed for an instant the mortal air that surrounds Orientals and all men, and he drew back from it with a gasp, for he was young. Never, never shall I get over this, he told himself. Most certainly my career is a failure, and my sons will be badly brought up. Since it was certain, he strove to avert it and looked at some notes he had made on a case at the hospital. Perhaps some day a rich person might require this particular operation, and he gain a large sum. The notes interesting him on their own account, he locked the photograph up again. Its moment was over, and he did not think about his wife anymore. After tea his spirits improved, and he went round to see Hamidullah. Hamidullah had gone to the party, but his pony had not, so Aziz borrowed it, also his friends riding breeches and polo mallet. He repaired to the Maidan. It was deserted except at its rim, where some bazaar youths were training. Training for what? They would have found it hard to say, but the word had got into the air. Round they ran. Weedy and knock need, the local physique was wretched, with an expression on their faces not so much of determination as of a determination to be determined. Maharaja, Salam, he called for a joke. The youths stopped and laughed. He advised them not to exert themselves. They promised they would not, and ran on, riding into the middle. He began to knock the ball about. He could not play but his pony could, and he set himself to learn, free from all human tension. He forgot the whole damned business of living as he scurried over the brown platter of the Maiden, with the evening wind on his forehead, and the encircling trees soothing his eyes. The ball shot away towards a stray subaltern who was also practicing, he hit it back to Aziz and called, send it along again. All right. The newcomer had some notion of what to do, but his horse had none, and forces were equal. Concentrated on the ball, they somehow became fond of one another, and smiled when they drew rein to rest. As these liked soldiers, they either accepted you or swore at you, which was preferable to the civilian's auteur and the subaltern liked anyone who could ride. Often play? He asked. Never. Let's have another chucker. As he hit, his horse bucked and off he went, cried, oh God! And jumped on again. Don't you ever fall off? Plenty. Not you. They reined up again, the fire of good fellowship in their eyes. But it cooled with their bodies for athletics can only raise a temporary glow. Nationality was returning, but before it could exert its poison they parted, 
saluting each other. If only they were all like that, each thought. Now it was sunset. A few of his co-religionists had come to the Maiden, and were praying with their faces towards Mecca. A Brahmini bull walked towards them, and Aziz, though disinclined to pray himself, did not see why they should be bothered with the clumsy and idolatrous animal. He gave it a tap with his polo mallet. As he did so, a voice from the road hailed him. It was Dr. Panalal, returning in high distress from the collector's party. Dr. Aziz, where have you been? I waited ten full minutes time at your house, then I went. I am so awfully sorry. I was compelled to go to the post office. One of his own circle would have accepted this as meaning that he had changed his mind, an event too common to merit censure. But Dr. Lal, being of low extraction, was not sure whether an insult had not been intended, and he was further annoyed because Aziz had buffeted the Brahmini bull. Post office, do you not send your servants? he said, I have so few, my scale is very small. Your servant spoke to me, I saw your servant. But, Dr. Lal, consider, how could I send my servant when you were coming, you come, we go, my house is left alone, my servant comes back perhaps, and all my portable property has been carried away by bad characters in the meantime. Would you have that? The cook is deaf, I can never count on my cook, and the boy is only a little boy. Never, never do I and Hassan leave the house at the same time together. It is my fixed rule. He said all this and much more out of civility to save Dr. Lal's face. It was not offered as truth and should not have been criticized as such. But the other demolished it, an easy and ignoble task. Even if this so, what prevents leaving a chit saying where you go? And so on. Aziz detested ill breeding, and made his pony caper, farther away, or mine will start out of sympathy, he wailed revealing the true source of his irritation. It has been so rough and wild this afternoon. It spoiled some most valuable blossoms in the club garden, and had to be dragged back by four men. English ladies and gentlemen looking on, and the collector sighed himself taking a note. But, Dr. Aziz, I'll not take up your valuable time. This will not interest you who have so many engagements and telegrams. I am just a poor old doctor who thought right to pay my respects when I was asked and where I was asked. Your absence, I may remark, drew commentaries. They can damn well comment. It is fine to be young. Damn well. Oh, very fine. Damn whom? I go or not as I please. Yet you promise me and then fabricate this tale of a telegram, go forward, dapple. They went, and Aziz had a wild desire to make an enemy for life, he could do it so easily by galloping near them, he did it, dapple bolted, he thundered back onto the maiden, the glory of his play with the subaltern remained for a little, he galloped and swooped till he poured with sweat, and until he returned the pony to Hamidullah's stable he felt the equal of any man. Once on his feet, he had creeping fears. Was he in bad odor with the powers that be? Had he offended the collector by absenting himself? Dr. Panalal was a person of no importance, yet was it wise to have quarreled even with him? The complexion of his mind turned from human to political. He thought no longer, can I get on with people? But are they stronger than I? Breathing the prevalent miasma, at his home a chit was awaiting him, bearing the government stamp. It lay on his table like a high explosive, which at a touch might blow his flimsy bungalow to bits. He was going to be cashiered because he had not turned up at the party. When he opened the note, it proved to be quite different an invitation from Mr. Fielding, 
the principal of government college, asking him to come to tea the day after tomorrow. His spirits revived with violence, they would have revived in any case, for he possessed a soul that could suffer but not stifle, and led a steady life beneath his mutability. But this invitation gave him particular joy, because Fielding had asked him to tea a month ago, and he had forgotten about it, never answered, never gone, just forgotten. And here came a second invitation without a rebuke or even an allusion to his slip. Here was true courtesy, the civil deed that shows the good heart, and snatching up his pen he wrote an affectionate reply, and hurried back for news to Hamidullahs. For he had never met the principal, and believed that the one serious gap in his life was going to be filled. He longed to know everything about the splendid fellow, his salary, preferences, antecedents, how best one might please him. But Hamidullah was still out, and Muhammad Ali, who was in, would only make silly rude jokes about the party. Chapter 7 This Mr. Fielding had been caught by India late. He was over forty when he entered the Dodist portal, the Victoria Terminus at Bombay, and having bribed a European ticket inspector, took his luggage into the compartment of his first tropical train. The journey remained in his mind is significant. Of his two carriage companions one was a youth, fresh to the east like himself, the other a seasoned Anglo-Indian of his own age. A gulf divided him from either, he had seen too many cities and men to be the first or to become the second. New impressions crowded on him, but they were not the orthodox new impressions, the past conditioned them, and so it was with his mistakes. To regard an Indian as if he were an Italian is not, for instance, a common error, nor perhaps a fatal one and Fielding often attempted analogies between this peninsula and that other, smaller and more exquisitely shaped, that stretches into the classic waters of the Mediterranean. His career, though scholastic, was varied, and had included going to the bad and repenting thereafter. By now he was a hard-bitten, good-tempered, intelligent fellow on the verge of middle age, with a belief in education. He did not mind whom he taught, public school boys, mental defectives and policemen, had all come his way, and he had no objection to adding Indians. Through the influence of friends, he was nominated principal of the little college at Chandrapur, liked it, and assumed he was a success. He did succeed with his pupils, but the gulf between himself and his countrymen, which he had noticed in the train, widened distressingly. He could not at first see what was wrong. He was not unpatriotic, he always got on with Englishmen in England, all his best friends were English, so why was it not the same out here? Outwardly of the large, shaggy type, with sprawling limbs and blue eyes. He appeared to inspire confidence until he spoke. Then something in his manner puzzled people and failed to allay the distrust which his profession naturally inspired. The needs must be this evil of brains in India, but woe to him through whom they are increased. The feeling grew that Mr. Fielding was a disruptive force, and rightly, for ideas are fatal to caste and he used ideas by that most potent method, interchange. Neither a missionary nor a student, he was happiest in the give and take of a private conversation. The world, he believed, is a globe of men who are trying to reach one another and can best do so by the help of goodwill plus culture and intelligence, a creed ill suited to Chandra poor but he had come out too late to lose it. He had no racial feeling, not because he was superior to his brother civilians, but because he had matured in a different atmosphere, 
where the herd instinct does not flourish. The remark that did him most harm at the club was a silly aside to the effect that the so-called white races are really pink or grey. He only said this to be cheery, he did not realize that white has no more to do with the color than God save the king with a god and that it is the height of impropriety to consider what it does connote. The pink or grey male whom he addressed was subtly scandalized. His sense of insecurity was awoken, and he communicated it to the rest of the herd. Still, the men tolerated him for the sake of his good heart and strong body, it was their wives who decided that he was not a cyber really. They disliked him. He took no notice of them, and this, which would have passed without comment in feminist England, did him harm in a community where the male is expected to be lively and helpful. Mr. Fielding never advised one about dogs or horses, or dined, or paid his midday calls, or decorated trees for one's children at Christmas, and though he came to the club, it was only to get his tennis or billiards and to go. This was true. He had discovered that it is possible to keep in with Indians and Englishmen, but that he who would also keep in with English women must drop the Indians. The two wouldn't combine. Useless to blame either party, useless to blame them for blaming one another. It just was so, and one had to choose. Most Englishmen preferred their own kinswoman, who, coming out in increasing numbers, made life on the home pattern yearly more possible. He had found it convenient and pleasant to associate with Indians and he must pay the price. As a rule no English woman entered the college except for official functions, and if he invited Mrs. Moore and Ms. Quested to tea, it was because they were newcomers who would view everything with an equal if superficial eye and would not turn on a special voice when speaking to his other guests. The college itself had been slapped down by the public works department, but its grounds included an ancient garden and a garden house, and here he lived for much of the year. He was dressing after a bath when Dr. Aziz was announced. Lifting up his voice, he shouted from the bedroom, Please make yourself at home. The remark was unpremeditated, like most of his actions, it was what he felt inclined to say. To Aziz it had a very definite meaning. May I really, Mr. Fielding? It's very good of you, he called back, I like unconventional behavior so extremely. His spirits flared up, he glanced round the living room. Some luxury in it, but no order nothing to intimidate poor Indians. It was also a very beautiful room, opening into the garden through three high arches of wood. The fact is I have long wanted to meet you, he continued. I have heard so much about your warm heart from the Nawabahada. But where is one to meet in a wretched hole like Chandrapur? He came close up to the door. When I was greener here, I'll tell you what, I used to wish you to fall ill so that we could meet that way. They laughed, and encouraged by his success he began to improvise. I said to myself, how does Mr. Fielding look this morning? Perhaps pale. And the civil surgeon is pale too, he will not be able to attend upon him when the shivering commences. I should have been sent for instead. Then we would have had jolly talks, for you are a celebrated student of Persian poetry. You know me by sight, then. Of course, of course, you know me. I know you very well by name. I have been here such a short time, and always in the bazaar. No wonder you have never seen me, and I wonder you know my name, I say. Mr. Fielding? Yes? Guess what I look like before you come out. That will be a kind of game. You're five feet nine inches high, said Fielding, surmising this much through the ground glass of the bedroom door. Jolly good. What next? Have I not a venerable white beard? Blast. Anything wrong? 
I've stamped on my last collar stud. Take mine, take mine. Have you a spare one? Yes, yes, one minute. Not if you're wearing it yourself. No, no, one in my pocket. Stepping aside, so that his outline might vanish, he wrenched off his collar, and pulled out of his shirt the back stud, a gold stud, which was part of a set that his brother-in-law had brought him from Europe. Here it is, he cried. Come in with it if you don't mind the unconventionality. One minute again. Replacing his collar, he prayed that it would not spring up at the back during tea. Fielding's bearer, who was helping him to dress, opened the door for him. Many thanks. They shook hands smiling. He began to look round, as he would have with any old friend. Fielding was not surprised at the rapidity of their intimacy. With so emotional a people it was apartment to come at once or never, and he and Aziz, having heard only good of each other, could afford to dispense with preliminaries. But I always thought that Englishmen kept their rooms so tidy. It seems that this is not so. I need not be so ashamed. He sat down gaily on the bed, then, forgetting himself entirely, drew up his legs and folded them under him. Everything ranged coldly on shelves was what I thought. Dot I say, Mr. Fielding. Is the stud going to go in? I hear my dudes. What's that last sentence? Please, will you teach me some new words and so improve my English? Fielding doubted whether everything ranged coldly on shelves could be improved. He was often struck with the liveliness with which the younger generation handled a foreign tongue. They altered the idiom but they could say whatever they wanted to say quickly, there were none of the babuisms ascribed to them up at the club. But then the club moved slowly, it still declared that few Mohammedans and no Hindus would eat at an Englishman's table, and that all Indian ladies were in impenetrable veiled. Individually it knew better, as a club it declined to change. Let me put in your stud. I see the shirt back's hole is rather small and to rip it wider a pity. Why in hell does one wear collars at all? Grumbled Fielding as he bent his neck. We wear them to pass the police. What's that? If I'm biking in English dress, starch collar, hat with ditch, they take no notice. When I wear a fez, they cry, your lamps out. Lord Curtson did not consider this when he urged natives of India to retain their picturesque costumes. Hooray! Studs gone in. Sometimes I shut my eyes and dream I have splendid clothes again and am riding into battle behind Alamgr. Mr. Fielding, must not India have been beautiful then? With the Mughal Empire at its height and Alam graining at Delhi upon the peacock throne? Two ladies are coming to tea to meet you, I think you know them. Meet me, I know no ladies. Not Mrs. Moore and Ms. Quested? Oh yes, I remember. The romance at the mosque had sunk out of his consciousness as soon as it was over. An excessively aged lady. But will you please repeat the name of her companion? Miss Quested. Just as you wish. He was disappointed that other guests were coming, for he preferred to be alone with his new friend. You can talk to Miss Quested about the peacock throne if you like, she's artistic, they say. Is she a post-impressionist? Post-impressionism? Indeed, come along to tea. This world is getting too much for me altogether. Aziz was offended. The remark suggested that he, an obscure Indian, had no right to have heard of post-impressionism, a privilege reserved for the ruling race, that, he said stiffly, I do not consider Mrs. Moore my friend, I only met her accidentally in my mosque and was adding a single meeting is too short to make a friend, but before he could finish the sentence the stiffness vanished from it, 
because he felt Fielding's fundamental goodwill. His own went out to it, and grappled beneath the shifting tides of emotion which can alone bear the voyager to an anchorage but may also carry him across it on to the rocks. He was safe really, as safe as the sure dweller who can only understand stability and supposes that every ship must be wrecked and he had sensations the sure dweller cannot know. Indeed, he was sensitive rather than responsive. In every remark he found a meaning, but not always the true meaning, and his life though vivid was largely a dream. Fielding, for instance, had not meant that Indians are obscure, but that post-impressionism is, a gulf divided his remark from Mrs. Turton's why, they speak English but to Aziz the two sounded alike. Fielding saw that something had gone wrong, and equally that it had come right, but he didn't fidget, being an optimist where personal relations were concerned, and their talk rattled on as before. Besides the ladies I am expecting one of my assistants, Naran Godbol. Oh oh, the Dikani Brahman. He wants the past back too but not precisely Alamgr. I should think not. Do you know what the Kani Brahmins say? That England conquered India from them, from them, mind, and not from the Mughals. Is not that like their cheek? They have even bribed it to appear in textbooks, for they are so subtle and immensely rich. Professor Godbull must be quite unlike all other Dikani Brahmins from all I can hear say. A most sincere chap. Why don't you fellows run a club in Chandrapur, Aziz? Perhaps, someday just now I see Mrs. Moore and, what's her name, coming? How fortunate that it was an unconventional party? where formalities are ruled out. On this basis Aziz found the English ladies easy to talk to, he treated them like men. Beauty would have troubled him, for it entails rules of its own, but Mrs. Moore so old and misquested so plain that he was spared this anxiety. Adela's angular body and the freckles on her face were terrible defects in his eyes, and he wondered how God could have been so unkind to any female form. His attitude towards her remained entirely straightforward in consequence. I want to ask you something, Dr. Aziz, she began. I heard from Mrs. Moore how helpful you were to her in the mosque, and how interesting. She learned more about India in those few minutes talk with you than in the three weeks since we landed. Oh, please do not mention a little thing like that. Is there anything else I may tell you about my country? I want you to explain a disappointment we had this morning, it must be some point of Indian etiquette. There honestly is none, he replied. We are by nature a most informal people. I am afraid we must have made some blunder and given offence said Mrs. Moore. That is even more impossible. But may I know the facts? An Indian lady and gentleman were to send their carriage for us this morning at nine. It has never come. We waited and waited and waited, we can't think what happened. Some misunderstanding, said Fielding, seeing at once that it was the type of incident that had better not be cleared up. Oh no, it wasn't that. Miss Quested persisted. They even gave up going to Calcutta to entertain us. We must have made some stupid blunder, we both feel sure. I wouldn't worry about that. Exactly what Mr. Heaslop tells me, she retorted, reddening a little. If one doesn't worry, how's one to understand? The host was inclined to change the subject, but Aziz took it up warmly and on learning fragments of the delinquent's name pronounced that they were Hindus. Slack Hindus. They have no idea of society, I know them very well because of a doctor at the hospital. Such a slack, unpunctual fellow. It is as well you did not go to their house, 
for it would give you a wrong idea of India, nothing sanitary, I think for my own part they grew ashamed of their house and that is why they did not send. That's a notion, said the other man, I do so hate mysteries, Adela announced, we English do. I dislike them not because I'm English, but from my own personal point of view, she corrected, I like mysteries but I rather dislike muddles, said Mrs. Moore, a mystery is a muddle. Oh, do you think so, Mr. Fielding? A mystery is only a high sounding term for a muddle, no advantage in stirring it up, in either case, Aziz and I know well that India's a muddle. India's, oh, what an alarming idea. There'll be no muddle when you come to see me, said Aziz, rather out of his depth, Mrs. Moore and everyone, I invite you all, oh, please. The old lady accepted, she still thought the young doctor excessively nice, moreover, a new feeling, half languor, half excitement, bade her turn down any fresh path. Miss Quested accepted out of adventure. She also liked Aziz, and believed that when she knew him better he would unlock his country for her. His invitation gratified her, and she asked him for his address. Aziz thought of his bungalow with horror, it was a detestable shanty near a low bazaar. There was practically only one room in it and that infested with small black flies. Oh, but we will talk of something else now, he exclaimed. I wish I lived here. See this beautiful room. Let us admire it together for a little. See those curves at the bottom of the arches. What delicacy. It is the architecture of question and answer. Mrs. Moore, you are in India, I am not joking. The room inspired him. It was an audience hall built in the 18th century for some high official, and though of wood had reminded Fielding of the Loggia de Lanzi at Florence, little rooms, now Europeanized, clung to it on either side, but the central hall was unpapered and unglassed, and the air of the garden poured in freely. One sat in public, on exhibition, as it were, in full view of the gardeners who were screaming at the birds and of the man who rented the tank for the cultivation of water chestnut, fielding let the mango trees too, there was no knowing who might not come in, and his servants sat on his steps night and day to discourage thieves, beautiful certainly, and the Englishman had not spoilt it whereas Aziz in an occidental moment would have hung Maud Goodman's on the walls. Yet there was no doubt to whom the room really belonged. I am doing justice here. A poor widow who has been robbed comes along and I give her fifty rupees, to another a hundred, and so on and so on. I should like that. Mrs. Moore smiled thinking of the modern method as exemplified in her son. Rupees don't last forever, I'm afraid, she said. Mine would. God would give me more when he saw I gave. Always be giving, like the Nawab Hadda. My father was the same, that is why he died poor. And pointing about the room he peopled it with clerks and officials all benevolent because they lived long ago. So we would sit giving forever, on a carpet instead of chairs, that is the chief change between now and then, but I think we would never punish anyone. The ladies agreed. Poor criminal? Give him another chance. It only makes a man worse to go to prison and be corrupted. His face grew very tender, the tenderness of one incapable of administration and unable to grasp that if the poor criminal is let off he will again rob the poor widow. He was tender to everyone except a few family enemies whom he did not consider human, on these he desired revenge. He was even tender to the English, he knew at the bottom of his heart that they could not help being so cold and odd and circulating like an ice stream through his land. We punish no one, no one, he repeated 
and in the evening we will give a great banquet with an orch and lovely girls shall shine on every side of the tank with fireworks in their hands, and all shall be feasting and happiness until the next day, when there shall be justice as before, fifty rupees, a hundred, a thousand, till peace comes. Ah, why didn't we live in that time question mark but are you admiring Mr. Fielding's house, do look how the pillars are painted blue, and the balconies pavilions, what do you call them question mark that are above us inside are blue also, look at the carving on the pavilions, think of the hours it took, their little roofs are curved to imitate bamboo, so pretty and the bamboos waving by the tank outside, Mrs. Moore, Mrs. Moore. Well? She said, laughing, you remember the water by our mosque? It comes down and fills this tank, a skillful arrangement of the emperors. They stopped here going down into Bengal. They loved water. Wherever they went they created fountains, gardens. Hammams. I was telling Mr. Fielding I would give anything to serve them. He was wrong about the water, which no emperor, however skillful, can cause to gravitate uphill, a depression of some depth together with the whole of Chandra Pole between the mosque and Fielding's house. Ronnie would have pulled him up, Turton would have wanted to pull him up, but restrained himself. Fielding did not even want to pull him up. He had dulled his craving for verbal truth and cared chiefly for truth of mood. As for Miss Quested, she accepted everything as he said as true verbally. In her ignorance, she regarded him as India, and never surmised that his outlook was limited and his method inaccurate, and that no one is India. He was now much excited, chattering away hard and even saying damn when he got mixed up in his sentences. He told them of his profession, and of the operations he had witnessed and performed, and he went into details that scared Mrs. Moore, though Miss Quested mistook them for proofs of his broad-mindedness, she had heard such talk at home in advanced academic circles deliberately free. She supposed him to be emancipated as well as reliable, and placed him on a pinnacle which he could not retain. He was high enough for the moment, to be sure, but not on any pinnacle. Wings bore him up, and flagging would deposit him. The arrival of Professor Godbowl quieted him somewhat, but it remained his afternoon. The Brahman, polite and enigmatic, did not impede his eloquence, and even applauded it. He took his tea at a little distance from the outcasts, from a low table placed slightly behind him, to which he stretched back, and as it were encountered food by accident, all feigned indifference to Professor Godbold's tea. He was elderly and wizen with a grey moustache and grey-blue eyes, and his complexion was as fair as a European's. He wore a turban that looked like pale purple macaroni, coat, waistcoat, dhoti, socks with clocks. The clocks matched the turban, and his whole appearance suggested harmony, as if he had reconciled the products of East and West, mental as well as physical, and could never be discomposed. The ladies were interested in him and hoped that he would supplement Dr. Aziz by saying something about religion. But he only ate, ate and ate, smiling, never letting his eyes catch sight of his hand. Leaving the Mughal emperors, Aziz turned to caps that could distress no one. He described the ripening of the mangoes, and how in his boyhood he used to run out in the rains to a big mango grove belonging to an uncle and gorge there, then back with water streaming over you and perhaps rather a pain inside. But I did not mind. All my friends were paining with me. We have a proverb in Urdu, what does unhappiness matter when we are all unhappy together? Which comes in conveniently after mangoes. Misquested do wait for mangoes. Why not settle all together in India? I'm afraid I can't do that, 
said the dealer. She made the remark without thinking what it meant to her. As to the three men, it seemed in key with the rest of the conversation, and not for several minutes, indeed, not for half an hour, did she realize that it was an important remark, and ought to have been made in the first place to Ronnie. Visitors like you are too rare. They are indeed, said Professor Godbowl. Such affability is seldom seen. But what can we offer to detain them? Mangoes. They laughed. Even mangoes can be got in England now, put in fielding. They ship them in ice cold rooms. You can make India in England apparently, just as you can make England in India. Frightfully expensive in both cases, said the girl. I suppose so. And nasty. But the host wouldn't allow the conversation to take this heavy turn. He turned to the old lady, who looked flustered and put out, he could not imagine why, and asked about her own plans. She replied that she should like to see over the college. Everyone immediately rose, with the exception of Professor Godbowl, who was finishing a banana. Don't you come to, Adela, you dislike institutions. Yes, that is so, said Miss Quested, and sat down again. Aziz hesitated. His audience was splitting up. The more familiar half was going, but the more attentive remained. Reflecting that it was an unconventional afternoon, he stopped. Talk went on as before. Could one offer the visitors unripe mangoes in a fool? I speak now as a doctor. No. Then the old man said, but I will send you up a few healthy sweets. I will give myself that pleasure. Miss Quested, Professor Godbold's sweets are delicious, said Aziz sadly, for he wanted to send sweets too and had no wife to cook them. They will give you a real Indian treat. Ah, in my poor position I can give you nothing. I don't know why you say that when you have so kindly asked us to your house. He thought again of his bungalow with horror, good heavens, the stupid girl had taken him at his word. What was he to do? Yes, all that is settled, he cried. I invite you all to see me in the Marabar caves. I shall be delighted. Oh, that is a most magnificent entertainment compared to my poor sweets. But has not Miss Quested visited our caves already? Number. I've not even heard of them. Not heard of them. Both cried. The Marabar Caves in the Marabar Hills. We hear nothing interesting up at the club. Only tennis and ridiculous gossip. The old man was silent perhaps feeling that it was unseemly of her to criticize her race, perhaps fearing that if he agreed she would report him for disloyalty, but the young man uttered a rapid I know, then tell me everything you will, or I shall never understand India. Are they the hills I sometimes see in the evening? What are these caves? Aziz undertook to explain but it presently appeared that he had never visited the caves himself, had always been meaning to go, but work or private business had prevented him, and they were so far. Professor Godbowl chaffed him pleasantly. My dear young sir, the pot and the kettle. Have you ever heard of that useful proverb? Are they large caves? She asked. No, not large. Do describe them. Professor Godbowl. It will be a great honor. He drew up his chair and an expression of tension came over his face. Taking the cigarette box, she offered to him and Ta'aziz, and lit up herself. After an impressive pause he said, there is an entrance in the rock which you enter, and through the entrance is the cave. Something like the caves at Elephanta? Oh no, not at all. At Elephant there are sculptures of Shiva and Parvati. There are no sculptures at Marabah. They are immensely holy, no doubt, said Aziz, to help on the narrative. Oh no. Still, they are ornamented in some way. 
Oh no. Well, why are they so famous? We all talk of the famous Maraba caves. Perhaps that is our empty brag? No, I should not quite say that. Describe them to this lady, then. It will be a great pleasure. He forwent the pleasure, and Aziz realized that he was keeping back something about the caves. He realized because he often suffered from similar inhibitions himself. Sometimes, to the exasperation of Major Callender, he would pass over the one relevant fact in a position, to dwell on the hundred irrelevant. The Major accused him of disingenuousness, and was roughly right but only roughly, it was rather that a power he couldn't control capriciously silenced his mind. Godpole had been silenced now, no doubt not willingly, he was concealing something. Handled subtly, he might regain control and announce that the Marabar caves were, full of stalactites, perhaps, as ease led up to this, but they weren't. The dialogue remained light and friendly and Adela had no conception of its underdrift. She did not know that the comparatively simple mind of the Mohammedan was encountering ancient night. Aziz played a thrilling game. He was handling a human toy that refused to work. He knew that much. If it worked, neither he nor Professor Godbowl would be the least advantaged, but the attempt enthralled him and was akin to abstract thought. On he chattered defeated at every move by an opponent who would not even admit that a move had been made, and further than ever from discovering what, if anything, was extraordinary about the Marabar caves. Into this Ronnie dropped. With an annoyance he took no trouble to conceal, he called from the garden, What's happened to Fielding? Where's my mother? Good evening. She replied coolly. I want you and mother at once. There's to be polo. I thought there was to be no polo. Everything's altered. Some soldier men have come in. Come along and I'll tell you about it. Your mother will return shortly, sir, said Professor Godbowl, who had risen with deference. There is but little to see at our poor college. Ronnie took no notice but continued to address his remarks to a dealer, he had hurried away from his work to take her to see the polo, because he thought it would give her pleasure, he did not mean to be rude to the two men, but the only link he could be conscious of with an Indian was the official, and neither happened to be his subordinate, as private individuals he forgot them, unfortunately Aziz was in no mood to be forgotten, he would not give up the secure and intimate note of the last hour, he had not risen with God bowl, and now, offensively friendly, called from his seat, come along up and join us, Mr. Heaslop, sit down till your mother turns up. Ronnie replied by ordering one of Fielding's servants to fetch his master at once. He may not understand that. Allow me, Aziz repeated the order idiomatically. Ronnie was tempted to retort. He knew the type, he knew all the types, and this was the spoiled westernized. But he was a servant of the government, it was his job to avoid incidents, so he said nothing and ignored the provocation that Aziz continued to offer. Aziz was provocative. Everything he said had an impertinent flavor raw jarred. His wings were failing, but he refused to fall without a struggle. He did not mean to be impertinent to Mr. Heaslop, who had never done him harm, but here was an Anglo-Indian who must become a man before comfort could be regained. He did not mean to be greasily confidential to Miss Quested, only to enlist her support, nor to be loud and jolly towards Professor Godbowl. A strange quartet, he fluttering to the ground, she puzzled by the sudden ugliness, Ronnie fuming, the Brahmin observing all three, but with downcast eyes and hands folded, as if nothing was noticeable. A scene from a play thought Fielding, 
who now saw them from the distance across the garden grouped among the blue pillars of his beautiful hall. Don't trouble to come, mother, Ronnie called, we're just starting. Then he hurried to Fielding, drew him aside and said with pseudo heartiness, I say, old man, do excuse me, but I think perhaps you oughtn't to have left Miss Quested alone. I'm sorry, what's up? replied Fielding, also trying to be genial. Well I'm the sun-dried bureaucrat, no doubt, still, I don't like to see an English girl left smoking with two Indians. She stopped, as she smokes, by her own wish, old man. Yes, that's all right in England. I really can't see the harm. If you can't see, you can't see. Can't you see that fellow's a bounder? Aziz flamboyant, was patronizing Mrs. Moore. He isn't a bounder, protested Fielding. His nerves are on edge, that's all. What should have upset his precious nerves? I don't know, he was all right when I left. Well, it's nothing I've said, said Ronnie reassuringly. I never even spoke to him. Oh well, come along now, and take your ladies away, the catastrophe over. Fielding don't think I'm taking it badly, or anything of that sort. I suppose you won't come onto the polo with us? We should all be delighted. I'm afraid I can't, thanks all the same. I'm awfully sorry you feel I've been remiss. I didn't mean to be. So the leave-taking began, everyone was cross or wretched. It was as if irritation exuded from the very soil. Could one have been so petty on a Scotch moor or an Italian alp? Fielding wondered afterwards. There seemed no reserve of tranquility to draw upon in India. Either none, or else tranquility swallowed up everything as it appeared to do for Professor Godbowl. Here was Aziz all shoddy and odious, Mrs. Moore and Ms. Quested both silly, and he himself and his lop both decorous on the surface, but detestable really, and detesting each other. Goodbye, Mr. Fielding, and thank you so much. What lovely college buildings. Goodbye, Mrs. Moore. Goodbye. Mr. Fielding. Such an interesting afternoon. Goodbye, Miss Quested. Goodbye, Dr. Aziz. Goodbye, Mrs. Moore. Goodbye, Dr. Aziz. Goodbye, Miss Quested. He pumped her hand up and down to show that he felt at ease. You'll jolly well not forget those caves won't you? I'll fix the whole show up in a jiffy. Thank you. Inspired by the devil to a final effort, he added, what a shame you leave India so soon. Oh, do reconsider your decision, do stay. Goodbye, Professor Godbowl, she continued, suddenly agitated. It's a shame we never heard you sing. I may sing now, he replied, and did. His thin voice rose, and gave out one sound after another. At times there seemed rhythm, at times there was the illusion of a western melody. But the ear, baffled repeatedly, soon lost any clue, and wandered in a maze of noises, none harsh or unpleasant, none intelligible. It was the song of an unknown bird. Only the servants understood it. They began to whisper to one another. The man who was gathering water chestnut came naked out of the tank. His lips parted with delight, disclosing his scarlet tongue. The sounds continued and ceased after a few moments as casually as they had begun, apparently half through a bar, and upon the subdominant. Thanks so much. What was that? asked Fielding. I will explain in detail. It was a religious song. I placed myself in the position of a milkmaiden. I say to Shri Krishna, come. Come to me only. The God refuses to come. I grow humble and say, do not come to me only. Multiply yourself into a hundred Krishnas, 
and let one go to each of my hundred companions, but one, O Lord of the universe, come to me. He refuses to come. This is repeated several times. The song is composed in a raga appropriate to the present hour, which is the evening. But he comes in some other song, I hope. Said Mrs. Moore gently, Oh no, he refuses to come, repeated God Bowl, perhaps not understanding her question. I say to him, Come, he neglects to come. Ronnie's steps had died away, and there was a moment of absolute silence. No ripple disturbed the water, no leaf stirred. Chapter 8 Although Miss Quested had known Ronnie well in England, she felt well advised to visit him before deciding to be his wife. India had developed sides of his character that she had never admired. His self-complacency his censoriousness, his lack of subtlety, all grew vivid beneath the tropic sky, he seemed more indifferent than of old to what was passing in the minds of his fellows, more certain that he was right about them or that if he was wrong it didn't matter. When proved wrong, he was particularly exasperating, he always managed to suggest that she needn't have bothered to prove it. The point she made was never the relevant point. Her arguments conclusive but barren, she was reminded that he had expert knowledge and she none, and that experience would not help her because she could not interpret it. A public school, London University, a year at a crammer's, a particular sequence of posts in a particular province, a fall from a horse and a touch of fever were presented to her as the only training by which Indians and all who reside in their country can be understood, the only training she could comprehend, that is to say, for of course above Ronnie the stretched the higher realms of knowledge, inhabited by Callenders and Turtons, who had been not one year in the country but twenty and whose instincts were superhuman. For himself he made no extravagant claims, she wished he would. It was the qualified bray of the callow official, the I am not perfect, but, that got on her nerves. How gross he had been at Mr. Fielding's, spoiling the talk and walking off in the middle of the haunting song, as he drove them away in the tum-tum. Her irritation became unbearable, and she did not realize that much of it was directed against herself. She longed for an opportunity to fly out at him, and since he felt cross too, and they were both in India, an opportunity soon occurred. They had scarcely left the college grounds before she heard him say to his mother, who was with him on the front seat, what was that about caves? and she promptly opened fire. Mrs. Moore, your delightful doctor has decided on a picnic, instead of a party in his house, we are to meet him out there, you, myself, Mr. Fielding, Professor Godbowl, exactly the same party. Out where? asked Ronnie. The Marabar Caves. Well, I'm blessed, he murmured after a pause. Did he descend to any details? He did not. If you had spoken to him, we could have arranged them. He shook his head laughing. Have I said anything funny? I was only thinking how the worthy doctor's collar climbed up his neck. I thought you were discussing the caves. So I am. Aziz was exquisitely dressed, from type in to spats, but he had forgotten his back collar stud and the you have the Indian all over, in attention to detail, the fundamental slackness that reveals the race. Similarly, to meet in the caves as if they were the clock at Charing Cross, when they're miles from a station and each other. Have you been to them? No, but I know all about them, naturally. Oh naturally. Are you too pledged to this expedition, mother? Mother is pledged to nothing, said Mrs. Moore, rather unexpectedly, certainly not to this polo, will you drive up to the bungalow first, and drop me there, 
Please, I prefer to rest. Drop me too, said Adila, I don't want to watch polo either, I'm sure. Simpler to drop the polo, said Ronnie, tired and disappointed. He quite lost self-control, and added in a loud lecturing voice, I won't have you messing about with Indians anymore. If you want to go to the Marabar Caves, you'll go under British auspices. I've never heard of these caves, I don't know what or where they are, said Mrs. Moore, but I really can't have she tapped the cushion beside her, so much quarreling and tiresomeness. The young people were ashamed. They dropped her at the bungalow and drove on together to the polo, feeling it was the least they could do. Their crackling bad humor left them, but the heaviness of their spirit remained. Thunderstorms seldom clear the air. Miss Quested was thinking over her own behavior, and didn't like it at all. Instead of weighing Ronnie and herself, and coming to a reasoned conclusion about marriage, she had incidentally, in the course of a talk about mangoes, remarked to mixed company that she didn't mean to stop in India, which meant that she wouldn't marry Ronnie, but what a way to announce it, what a way for a civilized girl to behave. She owed him an explanation, but unfortunately there was nothing to explain. The thorough talk so dear to her principles and temperament had been postponed until too late. There seemed no point in being disagreeable to him and formulating her complaints against his character at this hour of the day, which was the evening. The polo took place on the Mayadan near the entrance of Chandrapur city. The sun was already declining and each of the trees held a premonition of night. They walked away from the governing group to a distant seat, and there, feeling that it was his due and her own, she forced out of herself the undigested remark, We must have a thorough talk, Ronnie, I'm afraid. My temper's rotten, I must apologize was his reply. I didn't mean to order you and mother about, but of course the way those Bengalis let you down this morning annoyed me, and I don't want that sort of thing to keep happening. It's nothing to do with them that I No, but Aziz would make some similar muddle over the caves. He meant nothing by the invitation, I could tell by his voice, it's just their way of being pleasant. It's something very different, nothing to do with caves, that I wanted to talk over with you. She gazed at the colorless grass. I finally decided we are not going to be married, my dear boy. The news hurt Ronnie very much. He had heard Aziz announce that she would not return to the country, but had paid no attention to the remark for he never dreamt that an Indian could be a channel of communication between two English people. He controlled himself and said gently, You never said we should marry, my dear girl, you never bound either yourself or me. Don't let this upset you. She felt ashamed. How decent he was. He might force his opinions down her throat, but did not press her to an engagement because he believed, like herself, in the sanctity of personal relationships. It was this that had drawn them together at their first meeting, which had occurred among the grand scenery of the English lakes. Her ordeal was over, but she felt it should have been more painful and longer. Adela will not marry Ronnie. It seemed slipping away like a dream, she said, but let us discuss things. It's all so frightfully important, we mustn't make false steps. I want next to hear your point of view about me, it might help us both. His manner was unhappy and reserved. I don't much believe in this discussing. Besides, I'm so dead with all this extra work Moharam's bringing, if you'll excuse me. I only want everything to be absolutely clear between us and to answer any questions you care to put to me on my conduct. But I haven't got any questions, you've acted within your rights, you were quite right to come out and have a look at me doing my work, it was an excellent plan, 
and anyhow it's no use talking further, we should only get up steam. He felt angry and bruised, he was too proud to tempt her back, but he did not consider that she had behaved badly, because where his compatriots were concerned he had a generous mind. I suppose that there is nothing else, it's unpardonable of me to have given you and your mother all this bother, said Miss Quested heavily and frowned up at the tree beneath which they were sitting. A little green bird was observing her, so brilliant and neat that it might have hopped straight out of a shop. On catching her eye it closed its own, gave a small skip and prepared to go to bed. Some Indian wild bird. Yes, nothing else, she repeated feeling that a profound and passionate speech ought to have been delivered by one or both of them. We've been awfully British over it, but I suppose that's all right. As we are British, I suppose it is. Anyhow we've not quarrelled, Ronnie. Oh, that would have been too absurd. Why should we quarrel? I think we shall keep friends. I know we shall. Quite so. As soon as they had exchanged this admission, a wave of relief passed through them both, and then transformed itself into a wave of tenderness, and passed back. They were softened by their own honesty, and began to feel lonely and unwise. Experiences, not character, divided them, they were not dissimilar, as humans go, indeed. When compared with the people who stood nearest to them in point of space they became practically identical. The Bill who was holding an officer's polo pony, the Eurasian who drove the Nawab Ahadah's car, the Nawab Ahadah himself, the Nawab Ahadah's debauched grandison, none would have examined a difficulty so frankly and coolly. The mere fact of examination caused it to diminish. Of course they were friends, and forever. Do you know what the name of that green bird up above us is? She asked, putting her shoulder rather nearer to his. Be eater. Oh no, Ronnie, it has red bars on its wings. Parrot, he hazarded. Good gracious no. The bird in question dived into the dome of the tree. It was of no importance. Yet they would have liked to identify it, it would somehow have solaced their hearts. But nothing in India is identifiable. The mere asking of a question causes it to disappear or to merge in something else. McBride has an illustrated bird book, he said dejectedly. I'm no good at all at birds, in fact I'm useless at any information outside my own job. It's a great pity. So am I. I'm useless at everything. What do I hear? shouted the Nawab Ahadah at the top of his voice, causing both of them to start. What most improbable statement have I heard? An English lady useless. No, no, no. He laughed genially, sure, within limits, of his welcome. Hello, Nawab Ahadah. Been watching the polo again? said Ronnie tepidly. I have, Saib, I have. How do you do? said Adela, likewise pulling herself together. She held out her hand. The old gentleman judged from so wanton a gesture that she was new to his country, but he paid little heed. Women who exposed their face became by that one act so mysterious to him that he took them at the valuation of their men folk rather than at his own. Perhaps they were not immoral, and anyhow they were not his affair. On seeing the city magistrate alone with the maiden at twilight, he had borne down on them with hospitable intent. He had a new little car, and wished to place it at their disposal. The city magistrate would decide whether the offer was acceptable. Ronnie was by this time rather ashamed of his curtness to Aziz and God Bowl, and here was an opportunity of showing that he could treat Indians with consideration when they deserved it. So he said to Adela, with the same sad friendliness that he had employed when discussing the bird, would half an hour's spin entertain you at all? 
Oughtn't we to get back to the bungalow? Why? He gazed at her. I think perhaps I ought to see your mother and discuss future plans. That's as you like, but there's no hurry, is there? Let me take you to the bungalow, and first the little spin, cried the old man, and hastened to the car. He may show you some aspect of the country I can't, and he's a real loyalist. I thought you might care for a bit of a change. Determined to give him no more trouble, she agreed, but her desire to see India had suddenly decreased. There had been a factitious element in it. How should they seat themselves in the car? The elegant grandson had to be left behind. The Nawab had a got up in front for he had no intention of neighboring an English girl. Despite my advanced years, I am learning to drive, he said. Men can learn everything if he will but dry. And foreseeing a further difficulty, he added, I do not do the actual steering. I sit and ask my chauffeur questions, and thus learn the reason for everything that is done before I do it myself. By this method serious and I may say ludicrous accidents, such as befell one of my compatriots during that delightful reception at the English club, are avoided. Our good Panilal, I hope, Saib, that great damage was not done to your flowers. Let us have our little spin down the Gangavati road, half one league onwards. He fell asleep. Ronnie instructed the chauffeur to take the Maraba road rather than the Gangavati, since the latter was under a bear, and settled himself down beside the lady he had lost. The car made a burring noise and rushed along a chaussee that ran upon an embankment above melancholy fields. Trees of a poor quality bordered the road, indeed the whole scene was inferior and suggested that the countryside was too vast to admit of excellence. In vain did each item in it call out, come, come. There was not enough God to go round. The two young people conversed feebly and felt unimportant. When the darkness began, it seemed to well out of the meek of vegetation, entirely covering the fields each side of them before it brimmed over the road. Ronnie's face grew dim, an event that always increased her esteem for his character. Her hand touched his, owing to a jolt, and one of the thrills so frequent in the animal kingdom passed between them, and announced that all their difficulties were only a lover's quarrel. Each was too proud to increase the pressure, but neither withdrew it, and a spurious unity descended on them, as local and temporary as the gleam that inhabits a firefly. It would vanish in a moment, perhaps to reappear, but the darkness is alone durable, and the night that encircled them, absolute as it seemed, was itself only a spurious unity, being modified by the gleams of day that leaked up round the edges of the earth, and by the stars. They gripped, bump, jump, a swerve, two wheels lifted in the air, brakes on, bump with tree at edge of embankment, stand still, an accident, a slight one, nobody hurt. The Nawab had awoke, he cried out in Arabic, and violently tugged his beard. What's the damage? inquired Ronnie, after the moment's pause that he permitted himself before taking charge of a situation. The Eurasian, inclined to be flustered, rallied to the sound of his voice, and, every inch an Englishman, replied, you give me five minutes time, I'll take you any damn anywhere. Frightened, Adela. He released her hand. Not a bit. I consider not to be frightened the height of folly, cried the Nawab Hadda quite rudely. Well, it's all over now, tears are useless, said Ronnie, dismounting. We had some luck butting that tree. All over oh yes, the danger is past. Let us smoke cigarettes, let us do anything we please. Oh yes enjoy ourselves, oh my merciful God. His words died into Arabic again.
wasn't the bridge. We skidded. We didn't skid, said Adela, who had seen the cause of the accident, and thought everyone must have seen it too. We ran into an animal. A loud cry broke from the old man. His terror was disproportionate and ridiculous. An animal? A large animal rushed up out of the dark on the right and hit us. By Jove, she's right, Ronnie exclaimed. The paint's gone. By Jove, sir, your lady is right, echoed the Eurasian. Just by the hinges of the door was a dent, and the door opened with difficulty. Of course I'm right. I saw its hairy back quite plainly. I say, Adela, what was it? I don't know the animals any better than the birds here, too big for a goat. Exactly, too big for a goat, said the old man. Ronnie said, let's go into this, let's look for its tracks. Exactly, you wish to borrow this electric torch. The English people walked a few steps back into the darkness, united and happy. Thanks to their youth and upbringing, they were not upset by the accident. They traced back the writhing of the tires to the source of their disturbance. It was just after the exit from a bridge. The animal had probably come up out of the nullah. Steady and smooth ran the marks of the car, ribbons neatly nicked with lozenges, then all went mad. Certainly some external force had impinged, but the road had been used by too many objects for any one track to be legible, and the torch created such high lights and black shadows that they could not interpret what it revealed. Moreover, Adela in her excitement knelt and swept her skirts about, until it was she if anyone who appeared to have attacked the car. The incident was a great relief to them both. They forgot their abortive personal relationship and felt adventurous as they muddled about in the dust. I believe it was a buffalo, she called to their host, who had not accompanied them. Exactly. Unless it was a hyena. Ronnie approved this last conjecture. Hyenas prowl in nullas and headlights dazzle them. Excellent, a hyena, said the Indian with an angry irony and a gesture at the night. Mr. Harris. Half a moment, give me ten minutes time. Sib says hyena. Don't worry Mr. Harris, he saved us from a nasty smash. Harris, well done. A smash, Sib, that would not have taken place had he obeyed and taken a skangavati side, instead of Maraba. My fault that I told him to come this way because the road's better. Mr. Leslie has made it pucker right up to the hills. Ah, now I begin to understand. Seeming to pull himself together, he apologized slowly and elaborately for the accident. Ronnie murmured, not at all. But apologies were his due, and should have started sooner because English people are so calm at a crisis, it is not to be assumed that they are unimportant. The Nawab Ahada had not come out very well. At that moment a large car approached from the opposite direction. Ronnie advanced a few steps down the road, and with authority in his voice and gesture stopped it. It bore the inscription Mud Cull State across its bonnet. All friskiness and friendliness. Mr. X sat inside, Mr. Heslop, Miss Quested, what are you holding up an innocent female for? We've had a breakdown. But how putrid. We ran into a hyena. How absolutely rotten. Can you give us a lift? Yes, indeed. Take me too, said the Nawabahada. Hey, what about me? cried Mr. Harris. Now what's all this? I'm not an omnibus, said Miss Derrick with decision. I've a harmonium and two dogs in here with me as it is. I'll take three of you if one will sit in front and nurse a pug. No more. I will sit in front, said the Nawabahada. Then hop in, I've no notion who you are. Hey no, what about my dinner? I can't be left alone all the night. 
trying to look and feel like a European, the chauffeur interposed aggressively. He still wore a cap, despite the darkness, and his face, to which the ruling race had contributed little beyond bad teeth, peered out of it pathetically, and seemed to say, what's it all about? Don't worry me so, you blacks and whites. Here I am, stuck in Dam India same as you, and you got to fit me in better than this. Nasu will bring you out some suitable dinner upon a bicycle, said the Nawab Ahada, who had regained his usual dignity. I shall dispatch him with all possible speed. Meanwhile, repair my car. They sped off, and Mr. Harris, after a reproachful glance, squatted down upon his hams. When English and Indians were both present, he grew self-conscious, because he did not know to whom he belonged. For a little he was vexed by opposite currents in his blood, then they blended, and he belonged to no one but himself. But Miss Derrick was in tearing spirits. She had succeeded in stealing the mud car. Her Maharaja would be awfully sick. But she didn't mind, he could sack her if he liked. I don't believe in these people letting you down, she said. If I didn't snatch like the devil, I should be nowhere. He doesn't want the car, silly fool. Surely it's to the credit of his state I should be seen about in it at Chandra Poor during my leave. He ought to look at it that way. Anyhow he's got to look at it that way. My Maharani's different. My Maharani's a dear. That's her fox terrier, poor little devil. I fished them out both with the driver. Imagine taking dogs to a chief's conference. As sensible as taking chiefs, perhaps. She shrieked with laughter. The harmonium, the harmonium's my little mistake, I own. They rather had me over the harmonium. I meant it to stop on the train. Oh Lord. Ronnie laughed with restraint. He did not approve of English people taking service under the native states, where they obtain a certain amount of influence, but at the expense of the general prestige. The humorous triumphs of a freelance are of no assistance to an administrator, and he told the young lady that she would outdo Indians at their own game if she went on much longer. They always sack me before that happens, and then I get another job. The whole of India seeds with Maharani's and Rani's and Bigams who clamor for such as me. Really? I had no idea. How could you have any idea, Mr. Heslop? What should he know about Maharani's? misquested. Nothing. At least I should hope not. I understand those big people are not particularly interesting, said Adela, quietly, disliking the young woman's tone. Her hand touched Tronny's again in the darkness, and to the animal thrill there was now added a coincidence of opinion. Ah, the you're wrong. They're priceless. I would scarcely call her wrong broke out the Nawab Ahada, from his isolation on the front seat, whither they had relegated him. A native state, a Hindu state, the wife of a ruler of a Hindu state, may beyond doubt be a most excellent lady, and let it not be for a moment supposed that I suggest anything against the character of Her Highness the Maharani of Mudkal. But I fear she will be uneducated. I fear she will be superstitious. Indeed, how could she be otherwise? What opportunity of education has such a lady had? Oh, superstition is terrible. Oh, it is the great defect in our Indian character. And as if to point his criticism, the lights of the civil station appeared on a rise to the right. He grew more and more voluble. Oh. It is the duty of each and every citizen to shake superstition off, and though I have little experience of Hindu states, and none of this particular one, namely Mudkal, the ruler, I fancy, has a salute of but eleven guns yet I cannot imagine that they have been as successful as British India, where we see reason and orderliness spreading in every direction, like a most health-giving flood.
Miss Derrick said golly. Undeterred by the expletive, the old man swept on. His tongue had been loosed and his mind had several points to make. He wanted to endorse Miss Quested's remark that big people are not interesting, because he was bigger himself than many an independent chief. At the same time, he must neither remind nor inform her that he was big, lest she felt she had committed a discourtesy. This was the groundwork of his oration, worked in with it was his gratitude to Miss Derrick for the lift, his willingness to hold a repulsive dog in his arms, and his general regret for the trouble he had caused the human race during the evening. Also he wanted to be dropped near the city to get hold of his cleaner and to see what mischief his grandson was up to. As he wove all these anxieties into a single rope, he suspected that his audience felt no interest, and that the city magistrate fondled either maiden behind the cover of the harmonium, but good breeding compelled him to continue, it was nothing to him if they were bored, because he did not know what boredom is, and it was nothing to him if they were licentious, because God has created all races to be different, the accident was over, and his life, equably useful, distinguished, happy, ran on as before and expressed itself in streams of well chosen words. When this old geezer left them, Ronnie made no comment, but talked lightly about Polo, Turton had taught him that it is sounder not to discuss a man at once and he reserved what he had to say on the Nawab's character until later in the evening, his hand, which he had removed to say goodbye, touched a dealer's again, she caressed it definitely, he responded, and their firm and mutual pressure surely meant something. They looked at each other when they reached the bungalow, for Mrs. Moore was inside it. It was for Miss Quested to speak, and she said nervously, Ronnie. I should like to take back what I said on the Maiden. He assented, and they became engaged to be married in consequence. Neither had foreseen such a consequence. She had meant to revert to her former condition of important and cultivated uncertainty, but it had passed out of her reach at its appropriate hour. Unlike the green bird or the hairy animal, she was labeled now. She felt humiliated again for she deprecated labels, and she felt too that there should have been another scene between her lover and herself at this point, something dramatic and lengthy. He was pleased instead of distressed, he was surprised, but he had really nothing to say. What indeed is that to say? To be or not to be married, that was the question and they had decided it in the affirmative. Come along and let's tell the mater all this opening the perforated zinc door that protected the bungalow from the swarms of winged creatures. The noise woke the mater up. She had been dreaming of the absent children who were so seldom mentioned, Ralph and Stella, and did not at first grasp what was required of her. She too had become used to thoughtful procrastination and felt alarmed when it came to an end. When the announcement was over, he made a gracious and honest remark. Look here, both of you, see India if you like and as you like, I know I made myself rather ridiculous at Fielding's, but it's different now. I wasn't quite sure of myself. My duties here are evidently finished, I don't want to see India now, now for my passage back was Mrs. Moore's thought. She reminded herself of all that a happy marriage means, and of her own happy marriages, one of which had produced Ronnie. Adela's parents had also been happily married, and excellent it was to see the incident repeated by the younger generation, on and on. The number of such unions would certainly increase as education spread and ideals grew loftier and characters firmer. But she was tired by her visit to government college. Her feet ached, Mr. Fielding had walked too fast and far, the young people had annoyed her in the tum-tum, and given her to suppose they were breaking with each other, 
and though it was all right now she could not speak as enthusiastically of wedlock or of anything as she should have done. Ronnie was suited, now she must go home and help the others, if they wished. She was past marrying herself, even unhappily, her function was to help others, her reward to be informed that she was sympathetic. Elderly ladies must not expect more than this. They dined alone. There was much pleasant and affectionate talk about the future. Later on they spoke of passing events, and Ronnie reviewed and recounted the day from his own point of view. It was a different day from the women's, because while they had enjoyed themselves or thought, he had worked. Moharan was approaching and as usual the Chandrapur Mohammedans were building paper towers of a size too large to pass under the branches of a certain sacred fig tree. One knew what happened next, the tower stuck, a Mohammedan climbed up the sacred fig and cut the branch off, the Hindus protested, there was a religious riot, and heaven knew what with perhaps the troops sent for. There had been deputations and conciliation committees under the auspices of Turton, and all the normal work of Chandrapur had been hung up. Should the procession take another route, or should the towers be shorter? The Mohammedans offered the former, the Hindus insisted on the latter. The collector had favoured the Hindus until he suspected that they had artificially bent the tree nearer the ground. They said it sagged naturally. Measurements, plans, an official visit to the spot, but Ronnie had not disliked his day, for it proved that the British were necessary to India, there would certainly have been bloodshed without them. His voice grew complacent again, he was here not to be pleasant but to keep the peace and now that Adela had promised to be his wife, she was sure to understand. What does our old gentleman at the car think? She asked, and her negligent tone was exactly what he desired. Our old gentleman is helpful and sound, as he always is over public affairs. You've seen in him our show Indian. Have I really? I'm afraid so. Incredible, aren't they? even the best of them, they're all, they all forget their back collar studs sooner or later. You've had to do with three sets of Indians today, the Batacharias, Aziz, and this chap, and it really isn't a coincidence that they've all let you down. I like Aziz, Aziz is my real friend, Mrs. Moore interposed. When the animal runs into us the Nawab loses his head, deserts his unfortunate chauffeur, intrudes upon Miss Derrick no great crimes, no great crimes, but no white man would have done it. What animal? Oh, we had a small accident on the Maraba road. Adela thinks it was a hyena. An accident? She cried. Nothing no one hurt. Our excellent host awoke much rattled from his dreams, appeared to think it was our fault, and chanted exactly. Mrs. Moore shivered, a ghost. But the idea of a ghost scarcely passed her lips. The young people did not take it up, being occupied with their own outlooks, and deprived of support it perished, or was reabsorbed into the part of the mind that seldom speaks. Yes, nothing criminal, Ronnie summed up, but there's the native, and there's one of the reasons why we don't admit him to our clubs, and how a decent girl like Miss Derrick can take service under natives puzzles me. But I must get on with my work. Krishna. Krishna was the peon who should have brought the files from his office. He had not turned up and a terrific row ensued. Ronnie stormed, shouted, howled, and only the experienced observer could tell that he was not angry, did not much want the files, and only made a row because it was the custom. Servants, quite understanding, ran slowly in circles, carrying hurricane lamps. Krishna the earth, Krishna the stars replied, until the Englishman was appeased by their echoes, 
find the absent peon a tanners and sat down to his arrears in the next room will you play patience with your future mother-in-law dear adela or does it seem too tame i should like to i don't feel a bit excited i'm just glad it's settled up at last but i'm not conscious of vast changes we are all three the same people still that's much the best feeling to have she dealt out the first row of demon i suppose so said the girl thoughtfully i feared at mr fielding's that it might be settled the other way black knave on a red queen they chatted gently about the game presently a dealer said you heard me tell aziz and god bowl i wasn't stopping in their country i didn't mean it so why did i say it i feel i haven't been frank enough attentive enough or something it's as if i got everything out of proportion you have been so very good to me and i meant to be good when i sailed but somehow i haven't been mrs moore if one isn't absolutely honest what is the use of existing she continued to lay out her cards the words were obscure but she understood the uneasiness that produced them she had experienced it twice herself during her own engagements this vague contrition and doubt all had come right enough afterwards and doubtless would this time marriage makes most things right enough i wouldn't worry she said it's partly the odd surroundings you and i keep on attending to trifles instead of what's important we are what the people here call new you mean that my bothers are mixed up with india india's she stopped what made you call it a ghost call what a ghost the animal thing that hit us didn't you say oh a ghost in passing i couldn't have been thinking of what i was saying it was probably a hyena as a matter of fact ah very likely and they went on with their patience down in Chandra Poor the Nawab had awaited for his car. He sat behind his townhouse, a small unfurnished building which he rarely entered, in the midst of the little court that always improvises itself round Indians of position, as if turbans were the natural product of darkness a fresh one would occasionally froth to the front, incline itself towards him and retire he was preoccupied his diction was appropriate to a religious subject nine years previously when first he had a car he had driven it over a drunken man and killed him and the man had been waiting for him ever since the nawab had was innocent before god and the law he had paid double the compensation necessary but it was no use the man continued to wait in an unspeakable form, close to the scene of his death. None of the English people knew of this, nor did the chauffeur. It was a racial secret communicable more by blood than speech. He spoke now in horror of the particular circumstances. He had led others into danger. He had risked the lives of two innocent and honored guests. He repeated, If I had been killed what matter it must happen sometime but they who trusted me the company shuddered and invoked the mercy of god only aziz held aloof because a personal experience restrained him was it not by despising ghosts that he had come to know mrs moore you know nuddin he whispered to the grandson an effeminate youth whom he seldom met always liked and invariably forgot you know, my dear fellow, we Muslims simply must get rid of these superstitions, or India will never advance. How long must I hear of the savage pig upon the Maraba road? Nyadin looked down. Aziz continued, your grandfather belongs to another generation, and I respect and love the old gentleman, as you know. I say nothing against him, only that it is wrong for us because we are young i want you to promise me nyedin are you listening question mark not to believe in evil spirits and if i die 
for my health grows very weak, to bring up my three children to disbelieve in them too. Nyedin smiled, and a suitable answer rose to his pretty lips, but before he could make it the car arrived, and his grandfather took him away. The game of patience up in the civil lines went on longer than this. Mrs. Moore continued to murmur red ten on a black knave, misquested to assist her and to intersperse among the intricacies of the play details about the hyena, the engagement, the Maharani of Mudkal, the Batach areas, and the day generally, whose rough desiccated surface acquired as it receded a definite outline, as India itself might, could it be viewed from the moon. Presently the players went to bed, but not before other people had woken up elsewhere people whose emotions they could not share, and whose existence they ignored. Never tranquil, never perfectly dark, the night wore itself away, distinguished from other nights by two or three blasts of wind, which seemed to fall perpendicularly out of the sky and to bounce back into it, hard and compact, leaving no freshness behind them, the hot weather was approaching. Chapter 9 Aziz fell ill as he foretold, slightly ill. Three days later he lay abed in his bungalow, pretending to be very ill. It was a touch of fever, which he would have neglected if there was anything important at the hospital. Now and then he groaned and thought he should die, but did not think so for long, and a very little diverted him. It was Sunday always an equivocal day in the east, and an excuse for slacking. He could hear church bells as he drowsed, both from the civil station and from the missionaries out beyond the slaughterhouse, different bells and rung with different intent, for one set was calling firmly to Anglo-India, and the other feebly to mankind. He did not object to the first set, the other he ignored knowing their inefficiency. Old Mr. Graceford and young Mr. Sawley made converts during a famine, because they distributed food. But when times improved they were naturally left alone again, and though surprised and aggrieved each time this happened, they never learnt wisdom. No Englishman understands us except Mr. Fielding, he thought. But how shall I see him again? If he entered this room the disgrace of it would kill me. He called to Hassan to clear up, but Hassan, who was testing his wages by ringing them on the step of the balcony, found it possible not to hear him, heard and didn't hear, just as Aziz had called and hadn't called. That's India all over how like us the we are. He dozed again and his thoughts wandered over the varied surface of life. Gradually they steadied upon a certain spot, the bottomless pit according to missionaries, but he had never regarded it as more than a dimple. Yes, he did want to spend an evening with some girls, singing and all that, the vague jollity that would culminate in voluptuousness. Yes that was what he did want. How could it be managed? If Major Callender had been an Indian, he would have remembered what young men are, and granted two or three days leave to Calcutta without asking questions. But the Major assumed either that his subordinates were made of ice, or that they repaired to the Chandrapur bazaars, disgusting ideas both. It was only Mr. Fielding who, Hassan, the servant came running, look at those flies, brother, and he pointed to the horrible mass that hung from the ceiling. The nucleus was a wire which had been inserted as a homage to electricity. Electricity had paid no attention, and a colony of eye flies had come instead and blackened the coils with their bodies. Hughes or, oh, those are flies. Good, good, they are, excellent. But why have I called you? To drive them elsewhere, said Hassan, after painful thought. Driven elsewhere, they always return. Hughes or? You must make some arrangement against flies. That is why you are my servant, 
said Aziz gently, Hassan would call the little boy to borrow the stepladder from Muhammad Ali's house, he would order the cook to light the Primus stove and heat water, he would personally ascend the steps with a bucket in his arms, and dip the end of the coil into it. Good, very good. Now what have you to do? Kill flies. Good, do it. Hassan withdrew. The plan almost lodged in his head, and began to look for the little boy. Not finding him, his steps grew slower, and he stole back to his post on the balcony, but did not go on testing his rupees, in case his master heard them clink. On Twitter the Sunday bells, the East had returned to the East via the suburbs of England and had become ridiculous during the detour, Aziz continued to think about beautiful women, his mind here was hard and direct, though not brutal, he had learned all he needed concerning his own constitution many years ago, thanks to the social order into which he had been born, and when he came to study medicine he was repelled by the pedantry and fuss with which Europe tabulates the facts of sex. Science seemed to discuss everything from the wrong end. It didn't interpret his experiences when he found them in a German manual, because by being there they ceased to be his experiences. What he had been told by his father or mother or had picked up from servants, it was information of that sort that he found useful, and handed on as occasion offered to others, but he must not bring any disgrace on his children by some silly escapade, imagine if it got about that he was not respectable, his professional position too must be considered, whatever made you call end a thought, as ease upheld the proprieties, though he did not invest them with any moral halo and it was here that he chiefly differed from an Englishman, his conventions were social. There is no harm in deceiving society as long as she does not find you out, because it is only when she finds you out that you have harmed her, she is not like a friend or a god, who are injured by the mere existence of unfaithfulness. Quite clear about this, he meditated what type of lie he should tell to get away to Calcutta, and had thought of a man there who could be trusted to send him a wire and a letter that he could show to Major Corlender, when the noise of wheels was heard in his compound. Someone had called to inquire, the thought of sympathy increased his fever, and with a sincere groan he wrapped himself in his quilt. Aziz, my dear fellow, we are greatly concerned, said Hamidullah's voice. One, two, three four bumps, as people sat down upon his bed. When a doctor falls ill it is a serious matter, said the voice of Mr. Said Mohammed, the assistant engineer. When an engineer falls ill, it is equally important, said the voice of Mr. Hack, a police inspector. Oh yes, we are all jolly important, our salaries prove it. Dr. Aziz took tea with our principal last Thursday afternoon, Pipe Trafi, the engineer's nephew. Professor Godbowl, who also attended, has sickened too, which seems rather a curious thing, sir, does it not? Flames of suspicion leapt up in the breast of each man. Humbug! exclaimed Hamadullah, in authoritative tones, quenching them. Humbug! most certainly, echoed the others, ashamed of themselves. The wicked schoolboy, having failed to start a scandal, lost confidence and stood up with his back to the wall. Is Professor God Bowl ill? inquired Aziz, penetrated by the news. I am sincerely sorry. Intelligent and compassionate, his face peeped out of the bright crimson folds of the quilt. How do you do, Mr. Said Mohammed, Mr. Hack? How very kind of you to inquire after my health. How do you do, Hamidullah? But you bring me bad news. What is wrong with him? The excellent fellow. Why don't you answer, Rafi? You're the great authority, 
said his uncle. Yes, Rafi is the great man, said Hamidullah, rubbing it in. Rafi is the Sherlock Holmes of Chandrapur. Speak up, Rafi. Less than the dust, the schoolboy murmured the word diarrhea, but took courage as soon as it had been uttered, for it improved his position. Flames of suspicion shot up again in the breasts of his elders, though in a different direction. Could what was called diarrhea really be an early case of cholera? If this is so, this is a very serious thing. This is scarcely the end of March. Why have I not been informed? cried Aziz. Dr. Panalal attends him, sir. Oh yes, both Hindus, there we have it, they hang together like flies and keep everything dark. Rafi, come here. Sit down. Tell me all the details. Is the vomiting also? Oh yes indeed, sir, and the serious pains. That settles it. In twenty-four hours he will be dead. Everybody looked and felt shocked, but Professor Godpole had diminished his appeal by linking himself with a co-religionist. He moved them less than when he had appeared as a suffering individual. Before long they began to condemn him as a source of infection. All illness proceeds from Hindus. Mr. Hack said. Mr. Said Muhammad had visited religious fairs, at Allahabad and at Huge Jain, and described them with biting scorn. At Allahabad there was flowing water, which carried impurities away, but at Huge Jain the little river Supra was banked up, and thousands of bathers deposited their germs in the pool. He spoke with disgust of the hot sun, the cow dung and marigold flowers and the encampment of saints, some of whom strode stark naked through the streets. Asked what was the name of the chief idol at Huge Jain, he replied that he did not know, he had disdained to inquire, he really could not waste his time over such trivialities. His outburst took some time, and in his excitement he fell into Punjabi, he came from that side and was unintelligible. Aziz liked to hear his religion praised. It soothed the surface of his mind, and allowed beautiful images to form beneath. When the engineer's noisy tirade was finished, he said, that is exactly my own view. He held up his hand, palm outward, his eyes began to glow his heart to fill with tenderness. Issuing still farther from his quilt, he recited a poem by Galib. It had no connection with anything that had gone before, but it came from his heart and spoke to theirs. They were overwhelmed by its pathos. Pathos, they agreed, is the highest quality in art. A poem should touch the hearer with a sense of his own weakness and should institute some comparison between mankind and flowers. The squalid bedroom grew quiet, the silly intrigues, the gossip, the shallow discontent were stilled, while words accepted as immortal filled the indifferent air. Not as a call to battle, but as a calm assurance came the feeling that India was one, Muslim, always had been an assurance that lasted until they looked out of the door. Whatever Galeb had felt, he had anyhow lived in India, and this consolidated it for them, he had gone with his own tulips and roses, but tulips and roses do not go. And the sister kingdoms of the north, Arabia, Persia, Fergana, Turkestan, stretched out their hands as he sang, sadly, because all beauty is sad and greeted ridiculous Chandra poor, where every street and house was divided against itself, and told her that she was a continent and a unity of the company, only Hamidullah had any comprehension of poetry. The minds of the others were inferior and rough, yet they listened with pleasure, because literature had not been divorced from their civilization. The police inspector, for instance, did not feel that Aziz had degraded himself by reciting, 
nor break into the cheery guffaw with which an Englishman averts the infection of beauty. He just sat with his mind empty, and when his thoughts, which were mainly ignoble, flowed back into it they had a pleasant freshness. The poem had done no good to anyone, but it was a passing reminder, a breath from the divine lips of beauty, a nightingale between two worlds of dust. Less explicit than the call to Krishna, it voiced our loneliness nevertheless, our isolation, our need for the friend who never comes yet is not entirely disproved. As ease it left thinking about women again, but in a different way, less definite, more intense. Sometimes poetry had this effect on him, sometimes it only increased his local desires, and he never knew beforehand which effect would ensue, he could discover no rule for this or for anything else in life. Hamidullah had called in on his way to a worrying committee of notables, nationalist in tendency, were Hindus, Muslims, two Sikhs, two Parsis, a Jain, and a native Christian tried to like one another more than came natural to them. As long as someone abused the English, all went well, but nothing constructive had been achieved, and if the English were to leave India, the committee would vanish also. He was glad that Aziz, whom he loved and whose family was connected with his own, took no interest in politics, which ruined the character and career, yet nothing can be achieved without them. He thought of Cambridge, sadly, as of another poem that had ended. How happy he had been there, twenty years ago. Politics had not mattered in Mr. and Mrs. Bannister's rectory. There, games, work, and pleasant society had interwoven, and appeared to be sufficient substructure for a national life. Here all was wire pulling and fear. Messers, said Muhammad and Hack, he couldn't even trust them, although they had come in his carriage, and the schoolboy was a scorpion. Bending down, he said, Aziz, my dear boy, we must be going, we are already late. Get well quickly for I do not know what our little circle would do without you. I shall not forget those affectionate words, replied Aziz. Add mine to them, said the engineer. Thank you, Mr. said Mohammed, I will. And mine, and, sir, accept mine, cried the others, stirred each according to his capacity towards goodwill little ineffectual unquenchable flames the company continued to sit on the bed and to chew sugar cane which hassan had run for into the bazaar and aziz drank a cup of spiced milk presently there was the sound of another carriage dr panalal had arrived driven by horrid mr amchand the atmosphere of a sick room was at once re-established, and the invalid retired under his quilt. Gentlemen, you will excuse, I have come to inquire by Major Corlander's orders, said the Hindu, nervous of the den of fanatics into which his curiosity had called him. Here he lies, said Hamidullah, indicating the prostrate form. Dr. Aziz, drive. Aziz, I come to inquire. Aziz presented an expressionless face to the thermometer. Your hand also, please. He took it, gazed at the flies on the ceiling, and finally announced some temperature. I think not much, said Ramchand, desirous of fermenting trouble. Some, he should remain in bed, repeated Dr. Panalal, and shook the thermometer down so that its altitude remained forever unknown. He loathed his young colleagues since the disasters with Dapple, and he would have liked to do him a bad turn and report to Major Callender that he was shamming. But he might want a day in bed himself soon, comma besides, though Major Callender always believed the worst of natives. He never believed them when they carried tales about one another. Sympathy seemed the safer course. How is stomach? He inquired, how head? And catching sight of the empty cup, 
he recommended a milk diet. This is a great relief to us, it is very good of you to call, Dr. Saib, said Hamidullah, buttering him up a bit. It is only my duty. We know how busy you are. Yes, that is true. And how much illness there is in the city. The doctor suspected a trap in this remark, if he admitted that there was or was not illness, either statement might be used against him, there is always illness, he replied, and I am always busy, it is a doctor's nature. He has not a minute, he is due double sharp at government college now, said Ramchand. You attend Professor God Bowler perhaps? The doctor looked professional and was silent. We hope his diarrhea is ceasing. He progresses, but not from diarrhea. We are in some anxiety over him. He and Dr. Aziz are great friends. If you could tell us the name of his complaint we should be grateful to you. After a cautious pause he said, hemorrhoids. And so much, my dear Afi, for your cholera hooted Aziz, unable to restrain himself, cholera, cholera, what next, what now, cried the doctor, greatly fussed, who spread such untrue reports about my patients, Hamidullah pointed to the culprit, I hear cholera, I hear bubonic plague, I hear every species of lie, where will it end? I ask myself sometimes. This city is full of misstatements, and the originators of them ought to be discovered and punished authoritatively. Rafi, do you hear that? Now why do you stuff us up with all this humbug? The schoolboy murmured that another boy had told him, also that the bad English grammar the government obliged them to use often gave the wrong meaning for words and so led scholars into mistakes. That is no reason you should bring a charge against a doctor, said Ramchand. Exactly, exactly, agreed Hamidullah, anxious to avoid an unpleasantness. Quarrels spread so quickly and so far, and messes, said Muhammad and Hak looked cross, and ready to fly out. You must apologize properly, Rafi. I can see your uncle wishes it, he said, you have not yet said that you are sorry for the trouble you have caused this gentleman by your carelessness. It is only a boy, said Dr. Panalal, appeased. Even boys must learn, said Ramchand. Your own son failing to pass the lowest standard, I think, said said Mohammed suddenly. Oh, indeed, oh yes perhaps, he has not the advantage of a relative in the prosperity printing press, nor you the advantage of conducting their cases in the courts any longer. Their voices rose, they attacked one another with obscure illusions and had a silly quarrel. Hamidullah and the doctor tried to make peace between them. In the midst of the din someone said, I say, is he ill or isn't he ill? Mr. Fielding had entered unobserved, all rose to their feet, and Hassan, to do an Englishman honor, struck with a sugar cane at the coil of flies. Aziz said, sit down, coldly, what a room, what a meeting, squalor and ugly talk, the floor strewn with fragments of cane and nuts, and spotted with ink, the pictures crooked upon the dirty walls. No punker, he hadn't meant to live like this or among these third-rate people, and in his confusion he thought only of the insignificant Rafi, whom he had laughed at, and allowed to be teased. The boy must be sent away happy, or hospitality would have failed, along the whole line. It is good of Mr. Fielding to condescend to visit our friend said the police inspector, we are touched by this great kindness. Don't talk to him like that, he doesn't want it, and he doesn't want three chairs, he's not three Englishmen, he flashed. Rafi, come here, sit down again. I'm delighted you could come with Mr. Hamidullah, my dear boy, it will help me to recover, seeing you. 
forgive my mistakes, said Rafi, to consolidate himself, well, are you ill, Aziz, or aren't you? Fielding repeated, no doubt Major Corlander has told you that I am shamming. Well, are you? The company laughed, friendly and pleased, an Englishman at his best, they thought, so genial. Inquire from Dr. Panalal. You're sure I don't tire you by stopping? Why, no. There are six people present in my small room already. Please remain seated, if you will excuse the informality. He turned away and continued to address Rafi, who was terrified at the arrival of his principal, remembered that he had tried to spread slander about him, and yearned to get away. He is ill and he is not ill, said Hamidullah offering a cigarette, and I suppose that most of us are in that same case. Fielding agreed, he and the pleasant sensitive barrister got on well, they were fairly intimate and beginning to trust each other. The whole world looks to be dying, still it doesn't die, so we must assume the existence of a beneficent providence. Oh, that is true, how true, said the policeman thinking religion had been praised. Does Mr. Fielding think it's true? Think which true? The world isn't dying. I'm certain of that. No, no, the existence of providence. Well, I don't believe in providence. But how then can you believe in God? Asked Sid Mohammed. I don't believe in God. A tiny movement as of I told you so passed round the company, and Aziz looked up for an instant, scandalized. Is it correct that most are atheists in England now? Hamidullah inquired. The educated thoughtful people? I should say so, though they don't like the name. The truth is that the West doesn't bother much over belief and disbelief in these days. Fifty years ago, or even when you and I were young, much more fuss was made. And does not morality also decline? It depends what you call. Yes, I suppose morality does decline. Excuse the question, but if this is the case, how is England justified in holding India? Though they were politics again. It's a question I can't get my mind on to. He replied, I'm out here personally because I needed a job. I cannot tell you why England is here or whether she ought to be here. It's beyond me. Well qualified Indians also need jobs in the educational. I guess they do, I got in first, said Fielding, smiling. Then excuse me again, is it fair an Englishman should occupy one when Indians are available? Of course I mean nothing personally. Personally we are delighted you should be here, and we benefit greatly by this frank talk. There is only one answer to a conversation of this type, England holds India for her good. Yet Fielding was disinclined to give it. The zeal for honesty had eaten him up, he said. I'm delighted to be here too, that's my answer, there's my only excuse. I can't tell you anything about fairness. It mayn't have been fair I should have been born. I take up some other fellow's air, don't I, whenever I breathe? Still, I'm glad it's happened, and I'm glad I'm out here. However big a mischief one is, if one's happy in consequence, that is some justification. The Indians were bewildered, the line of thought was not alien to them, but the words were too definite and bleak. Unless a sentence paid a few compliments to justice and morality in passing, its grammar wounded their ears and paralyzed their minds. What they said and what they felt were, except in the case of affection, seldom the same. They had numerous mental conventions and when these were flouted they found it very difficult to function. Hamidullah bore up best, and those Englishmen who are not delighted to be in India, have they no excuse? He asked. None. Chuck him out. 
it may be difficult to separate them from the rest, he laughed. Worse than difficult, wrong, said Mr. Amchand. No Indian gentleman approves chucking out as a proper thing. Here we differ from those other nations. We are so spiritual. Oh that is true, how true, said the police inspector. Is it true? Mr. Hack, I don't consider us spiritual. We can't coordinate, we can't coordinate, it only comes to that. We can't keep engagements, we can't catch trains. What more than this is the so-called spirituality of India? You and I ought to be at the committee of notables, we're not, our friend Dr. Lal ought to be with his patients, he isn't. So we go on. And so we shall continue to go, I think, until the end of time. It is not the end of time, it is scarcely 10.30, ha! Huh? cried Dr. Panalal, who was again in confident mood. Gentlemen, if I may be allowed to say a few words, what an interesting talk, also thankfulness and gratitude to Mr. Fielding in the first place teaches our sons and gives them all the great benefits of his experience and judgment. Dr. Lal. Dr. Aziz. You sit on my leg. I beg pardon, but some might say your leg kicks. Come along, we tire the invalid in either case, said Fielding, and they filed out, four Mohammedans two Hindus and the Englishman. They stood on the balcony while their conveyances were summoned out of various patches of shade. Aziz has a high opinion of you, he only did not speak because of his illness. I quite understand, said Fielding, who was rather disappointed with his call. The club comment, making himself cheap as usual, passed through his mind. He couldn't even get his horse brought up. He had liked Aziz so much at their first meeting, and had hoped for developments. Chapter 10 The heat had leapt forward in the last tower, the street was deserted as if a catastrophe had cleaned off humanity during the inconclusive talk. Opposite Aziz bungalow stood a large unfinished house belonging to two brothers astrologers, and a squirrel hung head downwards on it, pressing its belly against burning scaffolding and twitching a mangy tail. It seemed the only occupant of the house, and the squeals it gave were in tune with the infinite, no doubt, but not attractive except to other squirrels. More noises came from a dusty tree, where brown birds creaked and floundered about looking for insects. Another bird, the invisible coppersmith, had started his bonk. It matters so little to the majority of living beings what the minority, that calls itself human, desires or decides. Most of the inhabitants of India do not mind how India, is governed. Nor are the lower animals of England concerned about England, but in the tropics the indifference is more prominent. The inarticulate world is closer at hand and readier to resume control as soon as men are tired. When the seven gentlemen who had held such various opinions inside the bungalow came out of it, they were aware of a common burden, a vague threat which they called the bad weather coming. They felt that they could not do their work, or would not be paid enough for doing it. The space between them and their carriages, instead of being empty, was clogged with a medium that pressed against their flesh, the carriage cushions scalded their trousers, their eyes pricked, domes of hot water accumulated under their headgear and poured down their cheeks, salaaming feebly, they dispersed for the interior of other bungalows, to recover their self-esteem and the qualities that distinguished them from each other. All over the city and over much of India the same retreat on the part of humanity was beginning, into cellars, up hills, under trees. April, herald of horrors, is at hand. The sun was returning to his kingdom with power but without beauty, 
that was the sinister feature. If only they had been beauty, his cruelty would have been tolerable then, through excess of light, he failed to triumph, he also, in his yellowy white overflow not only matter, but brightness itself lay drowned. He was not the unattainable friend, either of men or birds or other suns, he was not the eternal promise, the never withdrawn suggestion that haunts our consciousness, he was merely a creature, like the rest, and so debarred from glory. Chapter 11 Although the Indians had driven off, and Fielding could see his horse standing in a small shed in the corner of the compound, no one troubled to bring it to him. He started to get it himself, but was stopped by a call from the house. Aziz was sitting up in bed, looking disheveled and sad. Here's your home, he said sardonically. Here's the celebrated hospitality of the East. Look at the flies. Look at the chinam coming off the walls. Isn't it jolly? Now I suppose you want to be off, having seen an oriental interior. Anyhow, you want to rest. I can rest the whole day, thanks to worthy Dr. Lal. Major Call Ender's spy, I suppose you know, but this time it didn't work. I am allowed to have a slight temperature. Call Ender doesn't trust anyone, English or Indian, that's his character, and I wish you weren't under him, but you are, and that's that. Before you go for you are evidently in a great hurry, will you please unlock that drawer, do you see a piece of brown paper at the top, yes, open it, who is this, she was my wife, you are the first Englishman she has ever come before, now put her photograph away, he was astonished, as a traveller who suddenly sees, between the stones of the desert, flowers. The flowers have been there all the time, but suddenly he sees them. He tried to look at the photograph, but in itself it was just a woman in a sari, facing the world. He muttered, really, I don't know why you pay me this great compliment, Aziz, but I do appreciate it. Oh, it's nothing. She was not a highly educated woman or even beautiful but put it away, you would have seen her, so why should you not see her photograph, you would have allowed me to see her, why not, I believe in the veiled, but I should have told her you were my brother, and she would have seen you, Hamidullah saw her, and several others, did she think they were your brothers, of course not, but the word exists and is convenient, all men are my brothers, and as soon as one behaves as such he may see my wife. And when the whole world behaves as such, there will be no more veiled. It is because you can say and feel such remark as that, that I show you the photograph, said Aziz gravely. It is beyond the power of most men. It is because you behave well while I behave badly that I show it you. I never expected you to come back just now when I called you, I thought, he has certainly done with me, I have insulted him. Mr. Fielding, no one can ever realize how much kindness we Indians need, we do not even realize it ourselves, but we know when it has been given. We do not forget, though we may seem to. Kindness, more kindness and even after that more kindness, I assure you it is the only hope. His voice seemed to arise from a dream, altering it, yet still deep below his normal surface, he said, we can't build up India except on what we feel, what is the use of all these reforms, and conciliation committees for Moharam, and shall we cut the tasia short or shall we carry it another route? and councils of notables and official parties where the English sneer at our skins. It's beginning at the wrong end, isn't it? I know, but institutions and the government don't. He looked again at the photograph. The lady faced the world at her husband's wish and her own, but how bewildering she found it. 
the echoing contradictory world, put her away, she is of no importance, she is dead, said Aziz gently, I showed her to you because I have nothing else to show, you may look round the whole of my bungalow now, and empty everything, I have no other secrets, my three children live away with their grandmama, and that is all, Fielding sat down by the bed, flattered at the trust reposed in him, yet rather sad. He felt old. He wished that he too could be carried away on waves of emotion. The next time they met, Aziz might be cautious and standoffish. He realized this, and it made him sad that he should realize it. Kindness, kindness, and more kindness, yes, that he might supply. But was that really all that the queer nation needed? Did it not also demand an occasional intoxication of the blood? What had he done to deserve this outburst of confidence, and what hostage could he give in exchange? He looked back at his own life. What a poor crop of secrets it had produced. There were things in it that he had shown to no one, but they were so uninteresting it wasn't worth while lifting a veil on their account, he'd been in love, engaged to be married, lady broke it off, memories of her and thoughts about her had kept him from other women for a time, then indulgence, followed by repentance and equilibrium, meager really except the equilibrium, and Aziz didn't want to have that confided to him, he would have called it everything ranged coldly on shelves. I shall not really be intimate with this fellow, Fielding thought, and then nor with anyone. That was the corollary, and he had to confess that he really didn't mind, that he was content to help people, and like them as long as they didn't object, and if they objected pass on serenely. Experience can do much and all that he had learnt in England and Europe was an assistance to him, and helped him towards clarity, but clarity prevented him from experiencing something else. How did you like the two ladies you met last Thursday? he asked. Aziz shook his head distastefully. The question reminded him of his rash remark about the Marabar Caves. How do you like English women generally? Hamidullah liked them in England, here we never look at them, oh no, much too careful, let's talk of something else, Hamidullah's right, they are much nicer in England, there's something that doesn't suit them out here, Aziz after another silence said, why you are not married, Fielding was pleased that he had asked, because I have more or less come through without it, he replied, I was thinking of telling you a little about myself someday if I can make it interesting enough. The lady I liked wouldn't marry me, that is the main point, but that's fifteen years ago and now means nothing. But you haven't children? None. Excuse the following question, have you any illegitimate children? Number. I'd willingly tell you if I had then your name will entirely die out. It must. Well. He shook his head. This indifference is what the Oriental will never understand. I don't care for children. Caring has nothing to do with it, he said impatiently. I don't feel their absence. I don't want them weeping around my deathbed and being polite about me afterwards which I believe is the general notion, I'd far rather leave a thought behind me than a child, other people can have children, no obligation, with England getting so chock-a-block and overrunning India for jobs, why don't you marry Miss Quested, good God, why, the girl's a prig, 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 kindly explain, isn't that a bad word, oh, I don't know her, but she struck me as one of the more pathetic products of western education, she depresses me, but prig, Mr. Fielding, how's that, she goes on and on as if she's at a lecture, trying ever so hard to understand India and life, and occasionally taking a note, I thought her so nice and sincere, so she probably is, 
said Fielding, ashamed of his roughness, any suggestion that he should marry always does produce overstatements on the part of the bachelor, and a mental breeze, but I can't marry her if I wanted to, for she has just become engaged to the city magistrate. Has she indeed? I am so glad. He exclaimed with relief, for this exempted him from the Marabour expedition, he would scarcely be expected to entertain regular Anglo-Indians. It's the old mother's doing. She was afraid her dear boy would choose for himself, so she brought out the girl on purpose, and flung them together until it happened. Mrs. Moore did not mention that to me among her plans. I may have got it wrong, I'm out of club gossip. But anyhow they're engaged to be married. Yes, you're out of it, my poor chap, he smiled. No miss quested for Mr. Fielding. However, she was not beautiful. She has practically no breasts, if you come to think of it. He smiled too but found a touch of bad taste in the reference to a lady's breasts, for the city magistrate they shall be sufficient perhaps, and he for her, for you I shall arrange a lady with breasts like mangoes, no, you won't, I will not really, and besides your position makes it dangerous for you, his mind had slipped from matrimony to Calcutta. His face grew grave. Fancy if he had persuaded the principal to accompany him there, and then got him into trouble. And abruptly he took up a new attitude towards his friend, the attitude of the protector who knows the dangers of India and is admonitory. You can't be too careful in every way, Mr. Fielding. Whatever you say or do in this damned country there is always some envious fellow on the lookout, you may be surprised to know that there were at least three spies sitting here when you came to inquire. I was really a good deal upset that you talked in that fashion about God. They will certainly report it. To whom? That's all very well, but you spoke against morality also? and you said you had come to take other people's jobs, all that was very unwise, this is an awful place for scandal, why, actually one of your own pupils was listening, thanks for telling me that, yes, I must try and be more careful, if I'm interested, I'm apartment to forget myself, still, it doesn't do real harm, but speaking out may get you into trouble, it's often done so in the past. There, listen to that. But the end of it might be that you lost your job. If I do, I do. I shall survive it. I travel light. Travel light. You are a most extraordinary race, said Aziz, turning away as if he were going to sleep, and immediately turning back again. Is it your climate, or what? Plenty of Indians travel light too, since and such. It's one of the things I admire about your country. Any man can travel light until he has a wife or children. That's part of my case against marriage. I'm a holy man minus the holiness. Hand that on to your three spies, and tell them to put it in their pipes. Aziz was charmed and interested and turned the new idea over in his mind. So this was why Mr. Fielding and a few others were so fearless. They had nothing to lose. But he himself was rooted in society and Islam. He belonged to a tradition which bound him, and he had brought children into the world, the society of the future. Though he lived so vaguely in this flimsy bungalow, nevertheless he was placed. I can't be sacked from my job because my job's education. I believe in teaching people to be individuals, and to understand other individuals. It's the only thing I do believe in. At government college, I mix it up with trigonometry, and so on. When I'm a saint, I shall mix it up with something else. He concluded his manifesto and both were silent. The eye flies became worse than ever and danced close up to their pupils, 
or crawled into their ears. Fielding hit about wildly. The exercise made him hot, and he got up to go. You might tell your servant to bring my horse. He doesn't seem to appreciate Mardu. I know, I gave him orders not to. Such are the tricks we play on unfortunate Englishmen. Poor Mr. Fielding. But I will release you now. Oh dear. With the exception of yourself and Hamidullah, I have no one to talk to in this place. You like Hamidullah, don't you? Very much. Do you promise to come at once to us when you are in trouble? I never can be in trouble. There goes a queer chap, I trust he won't come to grief, thought Aziz, left alone. His period of admiration was over, and he reacted towards patronage. It was difficult for him to remain in awe of anyone who played with all his cards on the table. Fielding, he discovered on closer acquaintance, was truly warm-hearted and unconventional but not what can be called wise. That frankness of speech in the presence of Ramchand, Rafi and company was dangerous and inelegant. It served no useful end. But they were friends, brothers. That part was settled. Their compact had been subscribed by the photograph. They trusted one another. Affection had triumphed for once in a way. He dropped off to sleep amid the happier memories of the last two hours. Poetry of Galib, female grace, good old Hamidullah, good fielding, his honored wife and dear boys. He passed into a region where these joys had no enemies but bloomed harmoniously in an eternal garden, or ran down water shoots of ribbed marble or rose into domes whereunder were inscribed, black against white, the ninety-nine attributes of God.